here's how we're going to start going through these ships today. Now, I can tell you right now, we're not going to get through every ship. I know I said every ship. Uh, we're going to get through as many as we can, but like there's there's, there's like 150 ships, something crazy. We can't do that. So we're going to try as hard as we can to get through the most interesting ones, according to chat, and see what we can do. To get to our first ship, though, I'm going to just send my mouse scrolling upwards through the videos in Star Citizen's history here, and we're just going to see where it stops. And whatever ship I see first, that's what we're going to start with. Great way of doing it, right? It's like flipping a coin almost. And what is it? Oh, it's the Santaki. Nope, that's the uh, car to all. All right, I don't see any video stuff. So honestly, let's just look at the ship page real quick, because like I said, we got to fly through this. It's a weird ship. There's no doubting that. And just like the Santaki, it works with, it, it animates in weird ways, and it's a completely different sort of design language from anything else in the game. Um, but it's super spindly. This thing is like, if you get hit with this thing, it's rough. And I don't know, anybody fly this in chat? Can you say definitively that this is much better at maneuvering than other ships? I think this and the Santaki Eye will benefit a lot from master modes because everybody else will be more limited in speed. And at slower speeds, this thing does a lot better. But to be honest, it is a very niche ship. It's not one that many people are going to be interested in. And it's probably something you'll see more in NPCs flying. And honestly, that's a solid one to start with. The 600i is something that I would spend a little bit of time on. Let's look at the trailer for it because it has one of the best trailers I think they ever released. It it hits. It goes. It did a good job of setting the stage for like what Origin was. Unfortunately, design-wise, it did not. And we'll get to that. The Origin 600i has Oh no, this is not the right one. No, 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 no. No, no, no. We don't want that one. Yeah, this is it. You can tell because it's all orchestral and stuff let's go What does it take to build a symphony? It takes a blueprint. Four movements that will dictate key, tempo, and the arrangement of musical notes that will create harmonies, melodies. It takes an orchestra. Master technicians of their craft, working in perfect unity to transform notes into sound and those sounds into an experience. But most of all, it takes emotion. A feeling so powerful that it transcends words and must be conveyed in another form. Introducing the new 600i mm. from Origin. Mm. A symphony in motion. Sorry for those happy ship noises. My bad. I get, I get carried away in that last scene. This looks so good to me. The new 600i. That's the best shot of the 600i, in my opinion. They really need to... Um, you know how the... What is it? The 400? No, it's the... What is it? Oh, the C1. You know the new, the new uh, Spirit series? How they retract their guns? The 600i, they have to do that on the rework. They can't have this, this ship with the guns out. Look at this thing. It's beautiful. Looks like a, looks like a fancy future mouse. 
I feel like both this one and the MSR look like a mouse. All right, so the 600i is a luxury explorer and touring ship. And while it is really nice, the design inside has been one of the worst uses of space probably in Star Citizen. And there's something to be said about luxury being, you know, you kind of use more space for stuff, but, you know, there's also good design. And I'm not, I'm not an architect. I'm not Morph. But I can tell you that this ship doesn't, is not great to use. Like for the size that it is, if you look at the other ships that you can use in this game of the same size, the newer ones are crazy more useful. And even a ship like the 890 Jump, which is much bigger than this, makes better use of space. So they are going back through this. They're going to be reworking all this stuff that we're seeing here. And we actually have a couple videos of this. So like you can see, I think this is a ship from Raul. Yeah, this is Raul's shot. Um, there's also a video here we can look at. This video, I know we're spending a lot of time on the 600i, but this is actually a pretty significant ship to go over because it doesn't get much coverage. And it's an important ship. Take a listen. Use of the space because anyone that's been on board a 600 i knows there's a lot of there's a lot of walking and going up and down to get to where you want to, and it doesn't really need to be like that. Currently, the 600 i is concept complete. There's a couple of rooms which haven't had full concept work done on them, such as the crew quarters. But for the most part, every room has had a complete and utter rework. The big change for the module uh, section is its placement. So rather than being the sort of central core of the ship that you had to go through to get to the back half of the ship, uh, it is now in the rear section of the ship, which allowed us to move the, the common shared areas to the central uh, section. We did that change because it just makes the flow of the interior better. Um, when you have a 600i, regardless of which uh, module you have, you know the, the front half of the ship is a consistent experience and then the, the gameplay alterations with that module is constrained to a very specific area at the back. So the best way to think of the 600i layout is between three parts. You have the very front of the ship, which is the bridge and the captain's quarters. For the most part, they've remained mostly the same. There's been a few tweaks to the layout of the chairs on the bridge, but generally that hasn't changed very much. The captain's quarters is Almost the same as it was before, except it's flipped around. The bathroom moved from one side to the other. The reason for that is directly behind that the lobby area. On the top deck, we now have a small docking collar with space for a few um, suits. And the opposite side of that is now a lift to take you between two floors into the rear, uh, the exterior of the ship. Directly behind that, which used to be the modular section, we now have on the top deck the crew habitation area. So it starts off with a large open shared communal space where there's places to eat, uh, make food. And then to the side of that, there's four private crew bedrooms. The floor beneath that now is where engineering and all the components that allow the ship to function have been moved to. I think very similar to what we've done on the 400i, where you have the, the separate engineering section beneath. Directly behind that, we then have the ship modular section. We'll start with the expedition version. So on the top deck, at the very, very top, we have the armory. There's a huge armory with plenty of extra suit lockers for you and your friends. To this is like extra equipment. This, this is bigger than the armory in the seat in the M2. This is a massive amount of space. It's also very funny to me to have an armory in a ship like this and to see it's like luxury dark. <laughs> the lighting's a little bit dimmer and it's red, but it's it's still origin. And I actually think they kind of make it work. It This reminds me a lot of the aesthetic of... Um, that I feel like the Mass Effect uh, Alliance goes for, specifically their more technological stuff. But I think this, obviously, you know, they're able to achieve graphics that make it look better in this. But if you combine this interior with like the exterior of the Spirit series, you'd have a pretty solid Mass Effect looking ship, I think. And on what you might encounter. Behind that, we then have the Hologlow that allow you to do the exploration. On the middle deck, we then have the medical bay, which will have a medical suite similar to that as the Carrick. It'll have a tier two med bed. Beside that, we then have the secondary cargo hold. So this cargo hold, it's more readily accessible for the crew. So it's more for your 
day-to-day -day supply. So if, if you want to have a box full of your food or your snacks, that, that's where you put it instead of down in your main cargo hold because you don't want to go rooting through your garage just to find that random pen that you've left. On the bottom deck of the Expedition version, we then have the main cargo hold and garage. So obviously, as you've seen from the pictures from the recent Inside Star Citizen, it is much, much larger than it was before with a much, much larger lift to fit much larger vehicles in it. Yeah. In that, there's also... In case you wanted to put a Nova tank in your luxury exploration ship for reasons. Two small lifts, one to allow you to bring cargo up to the main cargo area, and then there's the smaller one that goes through the three decks. Moving on to the Turing variant, we get a completely different experience. The Turing's primarily split between two main decks, though one of the decks is across two floors. So the upper deck brings you out into the large lobby area. From the <laughs> lobby area, you can yeah, This looks so much different from the 600i we were just looking at. Just go up the side staircases to the main meeting area slash eating room, as well as a bar. And if you go left and right from there, you can get to the private guest suites. Private guest suites are very large and luxurious. They also come with their own skate pods. The lower deck is a spa. So the spa has a pool, a sauna, bar, as well as a kitchen for the crew to actually- This all feels way more like mini 890 jump than it does the 890 jump feels like a large 600. I obviously, since they're changing this retroactively, but this really goes to show how much it helps for them to work on one ship to learn how to make the other ships in the series. And I think they're really going to put that to the test this year with the RSI ships. Maybe they're, they're trying to see, you know, if we can knock out three or four RSI ships right in one year and it works out well and they all look pretty cohesive and complete, maybe they're just going to start doing... Uh, sprints with different types of ships because this really benefited from the 890 jump. It just looks just like it now. Be able to make food for the guests. So whilst we're kind of doing a complete or almost a complete rework of the interior, on the exterior of the ship, we're trying to keep it as true to how it is now as we possibly can. There will be some slight changes. We'll need to move the hangar bay doors a little bit. Um, there'll be some additional kind of cutouts for escape pods and we need to fit the airlock in properly. Um, so there will be some minor changes, but overall we're trying to keep it as, as close to what you see now as a 600 as we can. So yeah, that's the 600i. And that is our first ship we're going over, I guess. I'm not gonna, that was a ton of time on that. Actually, just to cover the other ones, um, I mentioned that this was heavily affected by the 890 jump. We probably won't go over the 890 jump today, but this is also a luxury ship. And it's more of like, if, if the 600i was a yacht, this is like a cruise ship. This is literally supposed to be like a cruise ship. Like if you look at the original designs, tell me that's not ripped straight from like a Royal Caribbean ship bridge, you know? So you can, dang it. I really need to not have this mouse right next to my elbow. Can you move over here? There we go. Thanks, buddy. You can tell that they had the original idea of this being like a very commercialized cruise ship sort of thing. And they stuck with that. Obviously, they updated the design and made it look more like the actual origin in game. But you still get that vibe that it's a cruise ship. And I think anybody who's been on board also um, can see where that's coming in. It's definitely more luxury than commercial that we were seeing before. This is more like you got 10 really rich people on board instead of 200 fairly wealthy people. And... Um, the vibes reflect it, but this is a part of gameplay that's just not in the game, so the 890 jump's not that popular, but people do like it a lot and they're waiting to use it. The 100 series is going to be the go-to small ship if you are somebody who never wants to stop off at a space station because it has its own refinery system. No matter what gas you're flying through, you'll always be able to get the fuel you need. And that's completely unique to the 100 series. This is a great ship for people who are looking for a one-person ship, uh, not only does it have that refinery system, it can carry a little bit of fuel, and it's got a bed inside, so you can stay overnight on this wherever you go. It's a long distance, generally touring purpose ship, but you could use it for a couple different things. My pick is the 135C, which has an extra, I think, six SCU of storage, uh, an extra four. And it still keeps the refinery system. This thing will be a great little runabout if you're running to do a luxury um 
Luxury transport system, long distance luxury transport. You can easily ship things between eight different systems without stopping. And you're pretty low key in a small ship like this. So I think the 100 series makes both a case for luxury vehicles and also for keeping starter ships well after you've outgrown their, their use. Here's the first Constellation trailer, which kind of explains the second one. I better not get in trouble for this. This song. I mean, that's pretty solid. I liked it. This was... Can I just take a second to say I think this, this trailer probably got a lot of people obsessed with the idea of exploration in this game. And this is one of the older trailers. So it's, it's nine years old. So it sucks that we still can't do this kind of thing in the game. But um, from what I've seen, maybe not ex discovering new, new uh, life forms, but this is still what they have kind of planned for exploration. Location unknown. Everyone okay? That is to say flying places. <laughs> Did we get it? Jump point is charted, sir. Good. Comms, we got any contact? No, sir. Scope is clear. Keep looking. Scarlet, take us on the tour. Those graphics, though. With pleasure. I mean, these graphics still look good. We're so spoiled now. So this is the exploration-focused Connie. It's all yours, Doctor. We've got a protoplanet, no atmosphere. Unknown planet two. There's an atmosphere. Doctor. It doctor, you better shut the f up. You better not be lying, doctor. No, so when I said that it seems like this is still what they have planned for, for uh, exploration, this kind of stuff of like surveying a planet while we technically know from the galactopedia what a planet is made of getting this data for yourself in real time i think is part of the um focus around exploration and you'd also be doing this to get readings of the surface find the caves and crash wrecks and and stuff like that but um anyways doctor there's an atmosphere doctor it could sustain life Look at that face. <laughs> Look at this guy. This guy's looking at the launch of Squadron 42 right there. <laughs> He's like, it's real. It's here. I feel you, man. I also think this is a big scene people fell in love with the constellation because this looked sick with the fans and then you're like but why fans we have thrusters <laughs> but we love fans
So that's the Aquila. And then we jump into the Taurus, and this is the more kind of industrial cargo focused one. Yeah, for, for reference, this is the difference between a 2014 trailer and a 2021 trailer. They say that some things just don't go out of style. That the true classics never die. Touring, exploration, combat. And now introducing Long Haul Freight. The all new Robert Space Industries Constellation. You know, you notice how they they've always been kind of showing us these uh these cinematic versions of quantum travel, and they are all consistent with the way that they're now changing it to look like. Like if you look at the whole the whole, I mean, I think they're supposedly based on Ac Acubier drives, I believe is the name. And that there's forming a bubble around you that moves through space. Um, but they always have this bubble that forms in front of the ship and then drags the ship in. And it was always kind of like, why doesn't it look that cool in the game? But for those who have seen what we've seen recently, they're finally making it look like this. And it's actually really sick that um, it's consistent with what I guess they've been having their cinematics people do for years. So little, little things. Robert Space Industries Constellation Taurus still does it all. All right. So I actually, um, I'm not a huge fan of the Connie series. I like the ship for what it is, but I'm not a big fan of the design. I think it's a great ship, though. Uh, it is also, I think, one of the main ships of Star Citizen. One of the more recognizable ones. They say it's got a crew of three to four. This is going to be probably one of the smallest ships that you, you're you not going to have as good a time soloing. Anything shorter than this, this is like 70 meters. I think anything below this, you would have a better time soloing. But once you get into Constellation kind of class, you got a pretty decent distance to run to get to your components. You're going to have to run all the way from the front of the ship to the very back here in order to access and work on your stuff. But as you can see, it's got plenty of space for you and your crew. It's got couch. Um, the table pops out of the floor, which is a nice touch. These beds double as escape pods, so you, they just fire out the tops and bottoms of the ship. Uh, you got a three-person cockpit with two turrets on top and bottom. On the Kila, that top one is an exploration. On the bottom, that Taurus gives you a tractor beam, I think. Um, and then for some of them, or is it all of them? You have a snub ship, which is like the biggest part of this thing. Back here, you can't really see it, but I'm pretty sure I have footage of myself undocking from one. Hold on. So this is uh, this is me after docking. This was right when they released docking, and I was just practicing, testing it out. This is it looking, you know, just about how it looks. What did I say? There's Holston Coop. Oh, this is when I stole somebody's Merlin. So they were flying away, and I just kind of undocked the ship and <laughs> stole it. And this is actually a pretty big part of this ship because you have a small ship here and you can carry an additional ship on it that can save you in, when you know when you get attacked. This ship can go and sacrifice itself to save you when you're getting away. It can protect you. It can ferry you down to a planet when you don't need to take the whole ship down. So having that extra ship on the back of this one is super convenient. And I think right now it doesn't mean as much because the game is just so finicky and we don't spend a lot of time on our ships. But... When we're in the future and you're doing a long-term, multi-hour trip on this thing, having an extra ship to go out is going to be nice. The Phoenix doesn't, yeah, sacrifices the snub. That's the last variant of this, is the luxury transport. This plays into passenger transport gameplay, which will be a thing, <laughs> as many other things will be. And is part of that same exploration, touring, focused game loop that the 890 Jump and 600i are part of. So this is a competitor. It's at a little bit of a lower class than the 600i and a little smaller size, but it's going for the same kind of missions and gameplay. All right, so that's the Connie series. Next, I want to talk about the whole series. That's where I feel like going. Let's get industrial. 
first thing I'd like to look at with the whole series is just how much it it is an actual change to the structure of Star Citizen. It's not just a new ship. Like the whole sea came in and it's just a new ship, sure, but it's not a coincidence that the cargo refactor, um, the cargo gameplay loop, and the whole sea are all being finished around the same time. They were meant to two years ago. They were supposed to finish, not finish, but get the cargo refactor kind of in with the uh, raft, I think was their original plan. And that didn't really work out. So it took a little while longer, but now... They have clearly planned the cargo stuff to happen at the same time. And they're releasing things like this. This is an official infographic released from CIG. And it shows a lot of the stuff they've talked about when they talk about trade and hauling. The idea that every planet has a star system or a space station. And that space station acts as a distribution point for all the other areas. So you're running cargo missions from the space station to the planet. They don't have that here for some reason, which I find strange, but whatever. You're running <laughs> cargo missions from space stations to moons, moon, 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 and to other planets, and probably to other space stations. You can see right here with the dark blue. So they put out these kinds of infographics to show that the dark blue lines are where the hull C, the large freight, is going to go. These are the, the big haulers, the people who are just space trucking for days out in space, um, and you know in between planets it looks like and then probably upgrading from this in between systems the smaller ships your raft your hull a your hull b even your c2s your constellation tauruses all of those ships the not mass freight heavy those are running these missions taking the commodities and supplies that are specific to each moon or each city on the planet down to those places so in terms of missions and gameplay, you're supposed to be kind of deciding on how you want to run cargo hauling. And they're starting to really lean into that idea that people need to understand that, uh, releasing this with the hull C, and then also talking about cargo hauling a lot more in ISCs and inside Star Citizen and stuff. So you can see up here, it's all labeled Trade Hub, Trade Hub, Space Station, all that jazz. And after we saw CitizenCon, the discussion, I think, gave a lot more insight into uh, what they're thinking for that. They talked about working your way up through courier missions so that you don't have to buy all the commodities. You can just ship them. You can just be that whole sea that's shipping stuff back and forth like that. And, of course, the best part of the ship series is the whole seas trailer. I am, I'm, I'm not going to lie. I think their earlier trailers are better than their newer ones, CIGs. Some of their newer ones are pretty good, but most of their earlier trailers, I think, hit in a different way. But this is one of those later ones, one of the more recent ones that I think they just really capture the vibe of what people are looking for when it comes to this ship. And that's the most important thing with marketing, right? You got to sell the dream. Imagine. I gotta, I gotta jump in here real quick, because this, the lore of this trailer. What planet is this we're looking? I always thought this was Arcorp. Yeah, this has to be Arcorp. There's no way this could be any other planet but Arcorp, right? And then, and then, and then you quantum travel, fly away, quantum travel. And then you're in pyro? <laughs> am I am I missing something here? Do we just is this server meshing? Is that what just happened? This is pyro, right? Like I, this is not Stanton Star. But then But then But then it's it's a Stanton space station. <laughs> What's going on? I know it's a trailer.
Empire to the next star system. So this is the whole series. We just looked at the 600i, right? Let me give you a, a prime example of the size of the whole series. So here's the whole A. This is that small one that we said could be bringing stuff to and from space stations. Yeah, it's 17 meters on the 600i is 92. But then you bring in the whole B and you start to see that like they, they, they scale up a little bit. So this one's like, okay, all right. So 17, 49, one size, cool. Well, there's five. So then we bring in the whole C, the real freight hauler. Oh, and it's collapsed, expanded, there we go. And it starts to put into um, a little bit into perspective just how much cargo these things start to carry. And the way this ship works is you've got the, the hull A and the hull B. This is the, I think the hull C was the original ship. And then they made the hull A. And then they said, okay, let's make bigger versions of these. So they made the hull B as a bigger version of the A. And then they made the hull D as a bigger version of the C. And <laughs> they kept getting bigger. Um, 209 meters expanded. Like, just think about how much cargo is in this. The whole sea already is a ridiculous amount of cargo. And for some reason, Misk was like, you know, this just... This just doesn't quite do it for us. We need to... We need to go back to Earth standards. We need to talk about Texas size. And that's where the whole E came from. My friends, let me introduce you to the Game Breaker. <laughs> the literal unnecessary, the whole E, which, uh, you, you, you're gonna be able to fly. You're gonna be able to transport this much cargo. I don't think these will be used very much, to be honest. I think these are gonna be like a trip between Terra and Sol. And even then, you know, is it like one person carries a bunch of stuff between Terra and Sol, and then a bunch of people carry that stuff from Sol to like, or from, or sorry, they carry the stuff from Sol to Terra, and then those people carry it from like Terra to Stanton and Ellis and Magnus. It, the, the little bit of cargo that they've told us about so far is interesting and insightful, but dang, there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of complicated stuff that maybe as a game does or as a not game designer, I don't see the obvious solutions. And I, I hope maybe we can find somebody who's done this professionally, but uh, creating a cargo system that's gonna support this series of ships and scale from the 17 meter hull A here, which you have to zoom into here to see the whole thing. And then we can head over to the hull E. Somewhere over here is the D. Yeah, it's just, <laughs> it's just so pixelated. And let's just look at the, so this is what it was like to look at the whole A. Let me zoom out. And, and they have to scale up to that. It's crazy. So this is another really interesting part of Star Citizen that just doesn't get discussed as much because we always get stuck on the idea of how much money the game is taken to make, but like, how are they gonna build this system? What is it gonna look like? They've released a Q&A on the Hull E, but this is old. This is from probably nine years ago. Nine, yeah, nine years ago, technically now. It is 2024. Oh my God, that's so weird. Yeah, that is the whole series. Um, 98,000 SCU of storage. And you know, you're gonna have to be able to support it too. You can't just have one person flying around on this ship. The Hull C has a crew of four. They're saying that the Hull E is going to have a crew of five. Maybe that's true because you can have an engineer that handles the front and back section. But I'm thinking you're going to want multiple ship escorts if you're running a Hull E. Like, not just Gladius. That's that's crap. You're going to want, like, a hammerhead escort with this kind of thing. The Endeavor. Somebody called this one out earlier, said they wanted to see it. This one's crazy. I, I'm a firm believer that this is the last ship we'll get, but I they'll probably figure it out. This is a crazy, like capital class modular ship um that is supposed supposed to disconnect so the front part of the ship it disconnects and it flies as its own ship right so that's the first part that's pretty nuts um 
The the next parts that are nuts though are that they also have four modular points on the sides of the ships. I think it's actually four on the sides and one on the top. And you can have all kinds of modules on this ship. We're talking starting your own space cartel, floating through space, hard to track, shipping off drugs to the different planets that you fly around, and making a good profit while nobody can track you. We're talking get a telescope array, scan systems far away, and find... I don't know, to be honest. <laughs> a particle collider, run science missions to develop science points, I think. Um, general research or fuel pods to host refueling systems for ships to come and land and get more fuel at your ship if you want to be industrial focused. Or maybe you want to repair and you can have a module for that. Uh, what else is there? There's some crew modules or a hospital module in case you want to run a medical center in space. Or maybe you, maybe you want to cure cancer. Like, this ship is crazy, man. So... I think this is probably one of the longer term plans for the game and introducing this was a big move for them they introduced it in 2015 i don't think it's anywhere near close to coming out definitely more much more than three to five crew there's a lot with this ship you got a biodome module a fuel and resupply module a research module a general science module a landing module to act as a home base, or a frigate, I guess. A medical bay module. A vehicle service module. A super collider overclocking facility. And an extremely powerful mobile stellar observatory telescope module. You could buy each of these two. I don't think they're for sale now, but they used to be. This is one of those moonshot ideas for Star Citizen, I think, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't even think about this thing. The first one, as somebody mentioned, that we'll go over is the Apollo. Little medical clinic on thrusters. This is a cool ship. I wish this was an exploration ship. Uh, it's It can defend itself. It's got a turret. But the most important part of it is that it is a medical clinic with an interior that supports <clears throat> retrieval of people through a little sneaky here. Through the use of a drone, as you can see right here. So the RSI Apollo will come with drones. And they will retrieve people, bring them up into your ship, and drop them off in your medical beds on board, if we can find those. The medical beds are, yeah, you can see them here. And these are much more advanced than something like on the Cutlass Red or um, the Pisces, C8R. These are more akin to actually doing some real hard work. You're bringing people in here and getting them back up to regular um, health. You can either have, I think, three tier three beds, two tier two beds, or one tier one bed, if I'm not mistaken. Two tier one beds. Okay, yeah, you can do different combinations of the beds. They have a little, like, graph right here for how that works. But this will allow you to scale your medical job however you want and probably hire a couple more medics to work with you. It's got a crew of one to two, but obviously you might want people to go out on their own. Cargo of 228 SCU, so you got room for medical supplies and maybe some loot and stuff. But 275 bucks in real life. And it's not in game yet, so you don't even need to worry about buying it for UEC. But this is probably their next step up with medical gameplay. I mean, they're developing it. I really do hope that that means that they're planning on putting it out this year, but <clears throat> they also haven't talked about medical gameplay much. So who knows? Let's go to the Galaxy, because I, I like the Galaxy. This ship had a bit of a controversial release because it was released as a modular ship and um, they really leaned into that for the marketing, which I think is not great when you have all these other modular ships that haven't gotten modularity, but it's a really cool looking ship. Some people don't like the RSI style of the Space Dorito. This, honestly, this is kind of a weird picture for a ship like this, but I guess they always want to sell these as combat first. Um, I think of this as kind of a multi-purpose more science industrial leaning ship than anything. RSI has its ships for combat and we'll get to that. This one though, you can have different modules on the back. So here they're showing the hangar bay module. And see that again here, you got space for some cargo and stuff in there. Obviously the interior is looking pretty utilitarian as RSI is. Captain's quarters and um, a hallway, as you can see. 
I like the bridge. The bridge has a cool look to it. I wonder who's the navigator. I feel like this would be the captain, but maybe not. This is one of those ships that actually gives you that feeling of being on a large ship, though, with the bridge. And, you know, we don't have many capital ships. You also are sitting further back. You're not on the front. So, again, giving you that sort of feeling of being on a much larger ship that we haven't had too much of in the game yet, except for, like, the 890 jump does that. I think that's mostly it. You, you're not really getting a good idea of the size of this thing, though. Here's an Ursa. So, there's kind of a comparison. It's pretty big. The Ursa is about the size of the bridge itself. Not a little bit skinnier. Let's see if they show the modules. Yeah, so here's here's the refinery module. As you can see, tractor beams up these mining compartments. You can bring them on board. And you could basically have this ship out there as a mining center instead of having a cargo ship take all your, your mined goods from mining ships. You have this ship take the mined goods and then refine them. And then you have another ship take those refined goods and sell them for more. And that's going to be probably a pretty big operation a lot of people will do and this will be a good ship for that there's a cargo hauling variant as you can see it replaces that bottom area with an actual hangar elevator that drags some vehicles or cargo uh some medical variants i guess which they're implying the c8r is leaving from the medical station so you'd have like your whole medical clinic inside and then you have your ambulance so this could be the ultimate medical org ship this or another ship like it. Here's some more looks at the interior. This is the cargo variant with the tractor beams, making it easier to store and move stuff around in the side. Medical variant, you can see they've got room for supplies, but also some clinics on the side. Wow, this is gonna be amazing to see. I bet this is gonna be a popular ship for set pieces if we do end up being on NPC controlled ships. Here's more of the refinery module. You can see they've got refineries. This actually looks like a industrial air conditioning setup. But I guess that's because we use a lot of turbines for stuff. These look like just refinery turbines with tubing and stuff running and mabber jabber stuff, but uh, just kind of shows that the interior of the ship can be used for different stuff. And these are the layouts from above. Medical, refining, and the ship. That's the galaxy, the Perseus, which is actually another space Dorito, believe it or not. And this is a warship, if you couldn't tell from the gigantic cannons on the front of it. This is the ship that's on the thumbnail for this YouTube stream and video. Um, it again keeps the cockpit, the bridge, further back. It definitely lines up more with the style of the other warships that we've seen, like the Bengal and Javelin, with that raised up... I don't know if we get a good shot of that. The raised up bridge... Yeah, it's kind of raised up off the deck of the rest of the ship, which is partially for visuals, I think, but it also really draws a clear design similarity with the bangle. Yeah, how much PDC does this have? Because it's got the it's got the it's got the um, automated turret up top here. I don't think it has many other defensive turrets, and this does seem like I don't know actually what they just determine this as. Is this a destroyer? Just a gunship. It's got a size 2 manned turret. That's the one on the front there. It's got a size 3 remote turret. I guess that's on the back there. That, is that count as a gunship? Like, this thing doesn't have any defenses on its bottom? Oh, no, there's one on the bottom here. Okay, cool. So it looks like it has... Maybe I misread that. It's two size 3 turrets. In that case, it can defend itself, but it definitely sounds like it's got some weak spots. Yeah, it's not a lot, but they can't make it too overpowered, right? You can't let a ship like this easily defend itself all the time. Or else the fleet would not be necessary. It's got a docking collar here. It looks like it's on the side of the ship. Here is the uh, remote turret. It's interesting. The rem I thought that this meant that it was an automated turret. Maybe maybe these dishes imply that it could be automated in the future, or is, are all these remote turrets looking like this? So this is actually, the ship looks bigger than it is. I was always getting misled. This looks pretty large from this scene, right? And then the scene with the uh, with the bangle. You could also see it look, looking kind of big here. But then if you go and you look at it... Um, very gunship-esque. I'll give them that. You go and you look at it like next to a hammerhead. And you realize it's like pretty similar size to a hammy. Yeah, just a little bigger than the Connie. It's only a hundred meters long. 
So it's actually not a huge ship, but it does pack a punch with that size 7. And it still has that hangar bay, so you can carry some stuff inside of it. Ultimately, this could be a really powerful ship as like an anti-capital. You know, strike forces take this around when they know that large orgs are just kind of mobbing around in the system, killing everybody. This is the kind of ship you take out to take those people out. You got to defend it. But that size 7 can do some damage. 675 freaking dollars though. Oh my god. Yeah, I would I'd get this in game. So that's the Perseus. That's the more combat focused RSI. Yeah, it is the Polaris. I wanted to get through the three Doritos first. So this is the oldest of the RSI new ships, if that makes any sense. Introduced in 2016, this was the first ship from RSI that really had the new definitive design model that made it look a little bit more futuristic than something like the Bangle or the Connie. And people fell in love with it. I think it was very awkward the way this was introduced to the community uh, and could have been done better. Probably should have been done later too because there was just... Now that we're getting to the point where capital ship gameplay is coming online, it's clear that capital ships wouldn't work in the game until they specifically made combat for them. But this thing is a missile boat. So if the Perseus is a sniper, a a, um, a hands-on one-two punch kind of ship, this is a hit you multiple times kind of ship. And it is a huge favorite. It is the first capital ship we will be getting in the game, I think, with real capital gameplay following along with it. And I think it's going to be a, an eye-opener on how difficult it actually is to run these ships. These missiles are not going to be cheap. I think, how much did you guys say that these torpedoes were? Are they size 9s or something? Size 28 torpedoes. Doesn't say what size they are. It's got that same classic sort of bridge setup that we're seeing with RSI with the three person. This one actually looks like it's got six people, five people. Um, but that same, you know, all sitting in that half circle kind of 30k each a torpedo and i bet that's going up not only is it going up if you're in a system you know that's not stanton or terra or soul or castra or uh the, what's that other military system tiber something like that they're probably going to be even more expensive the idea of taking this ship out just to go and run some mission isn't going to be a thing unless you're filthy rich and you don't care about how much you're going to sink into it um, the reality of ships like this is that there's going to be a whole economy around running them. And that's why it's not necessarily a good idea for a solo player to just say, yeah, I just want to buy the ship. Because there's a lot they're still going to build into the game to make them more easy and more difficult. And some of that stuff can be frustrating when it doesn't go the way that we want it to. Let's look at, though, they did give us a little bit of an update on where this ship is. So here's the latest update on what they're saying about these larger RSI ships I just showed you guys. I want to touch again on like, yeah, why are we doing an RSI ship? Like, what is with that? So the thing about doing another RSI ship is that we've got a really well-established art style for RSI in our, in our universe. Um, and it gives us the ability to kind of skip, or train up newest members of the teams on something that's kind of quite a known element. That is absolutely not the only benefit, though. The way we are like, planning on tackling the Polaris is not tackling it as one ship. But actually, we want to tackle, well, anyone that knows our backlog knows we have a number of large RSI ships on there. And our kind of plan is that we tackle that as a family of ships. We don't just tackle one of them and then we go off and do something else for six months, a year, come back and do another one, something else, come back and do another one. We want to tackle them all together, one after the other. And what that really allows us to do is just kind of streamline our development process. We're able to... You know, for our more common areas of the ship, we're able to build kits that we're confident in, that we can reuse and we can make the most out of them. And then that allows us to focus our development time and our efforts really on the much more unique and the important, exciting areas of each ship. It, tackling them as a family kind of allows us to expedite their development. We leverage the experience that we've got within the team. And it just allows us to, like I say, streamline everything. So. First up, we've got the Polaris. Next up, we've got the Galaxy. Then we've got the Perseus. And that kind of closes out our, most of our large RSI ships. And then we can you know, see what we want to take on after that. Well, I, I think that's pretty much everything we want to talk about today. 
Um, however, before we go, we're, we're going to... Torsten's already stolen the, the predictable joke here. So we'll do one last thing to show you guys. So let's have a look. Okay, just to be clear, as somebody said in chat, what they're about to show us is a nice little sizzle reel of what's going on with the Polaris. This is a big deal because capital ships, like I said, have been taking a while and the Polaris will be the first, but at the end, they're gonna show us what the Polaris is meant for and that is killing capital ships. We talked about the Perseus being a sniper that patrols and takes out these large org ships. So is the Polaris, it's just the missile side of that. And it's bigger. <laughs> um, but it's good to remember that there's a lot of stuff that's gonna go into the game that doesn't mean when you fire two, two torpedoes at a big ship, it'll explode. It might get damaged or ripped apart or something. Just keep in mind, doesn't necessarily mean you just go off Idris whenever you want. With that being said, here's the Polaris. At the current state of the Polaris, in engine, in its white box state. Real quick, I actually just want to see something. Sorry to uh, <laughs> just step in here and ruin that video for you, but I want to see if they're hitting that consistent between consistency in the hallways, the uh, the shape of the hallways they want, because they showed the galaxy here. Yeah, this. So this is like a one, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, Pentag hexagon? What is it? seven pentagon? What is this? That's the same shape, right? Four, five, six, that's a hexagon. It's like a similar shape though. It's like a multi-sided upside down triangular shaped polygon. But they're pretty consistent when it comes to the different types of ships in the in the company. They're consistent at hitting these kinds of things, the doorways, the arches, the architectural details, making sure that they look fairly similar between the ships. Heptagon, huh? CIG knows their marketing. <laughs> They're like, what would make more prospective Polaris buyers want the Polaris? I don't know why. Why do people buy the Polaris to blow things up? It was a, it's a cool video for sure. And I was definitely not just two torpedoes. I was like four. The Arastra is actually the newest, I think, 
newest introduced concept we have in the game. This was unveiled November 25th, later on than the Zeus, which I think is the other one that was introduced then. This is a mining ship, and it's an it's I find it to be really interesting that they're going with this. And I'm also I'm really curious. I sure we'll know more by the end of the year. I'm curious to know why they're going in this direction. Because we have the Prospector, which I think is around 23 or 25 meters long, maybe. Where is that? Prospector is the f the one person mining ship. It's 26 and a half meters long, one person. And then we have the Mole from Argo. And it's coming in at a solid 50, 45 meters. So we've got that small ship. And we've got that medium ship. Um, my thinking would be that the next thing they'd want to do with mining ships is introduce a new form of the gameplay. Because at some point they do need to do that. And while I think the Orion might be that, it just feels like there's more to this area of gameplay than just what we're doing. And that might be because we don't have refining in. Refining might be that complication that, that needs to be in there to fill out this sort of ship. But I... I had hoped that they would be introducing this ship to introduce also maybe planetary bore mining or something that has to do with more persistent resource deposits. And maybe they will. They haven't talked a ton about it. But so far, we've got the concept. And really what it is, is it's a large mole with a refinery on board that can uh, really adequately defend itself. More, <laughs> more than you would imagine, it can defend itself and probably go on the attack sometimes. But it's got the onboard refinery. It's got, oops, it's got the bridge to support you and your friends, uh, somebody piloting, some, a couple people mining. I think it has four mining lasers. Let's see. It's got three size three remote turrets and four size three. I don't know if those are mining turrets. Here we go. Three remote lining lasers and one remote tractor beam. So you can see it's got all mining lasers concentrated on one rock. And this does, it, it does, it's concept art, which I, which kills me. But this does hint at much larger deposits. And I don't think we could really progress with a ship this big without larger deposits. So I do think mining will change. I'm just hesitant to speculate heavily on how much it might change. Because they're going to have to do something to make this interesting. We've got rocks on board. So they're going to want to also make it so that you can be doing stuff while these rocks are out and about. And maybe that's refining, but um, it just feels like this is a ship that's made for a much more developed mining game loop. And maybe over the next year they're planning on doing that. It's a cool ship. I love it. I hope to do, run some missions on it and take part in it and play in it. But uh, for 575 bucks. I think they're going to have to prove a little bit more of it being a difference from the other games or the other ships. Yeah, it has cargo in a garage. The garage is where the rocks are coming in. And I think it can carry six uh, capacity for ground vehicles. It is designed to hold two rock DSs or two Ursa sized vehicles. So, yeah, probably like three or four regular rocks comfortably. The refinery are also bigger than the ones on the Expanse, which is good. The Expanse is kind of like your starting refinery ship. This one. You know, obviously, it seems like this compares more to the galaxy, maybe. Now I want to talk about the Zeus. The Zeus is the newest besides the Arastra concept. And a lot of people really like this ship. This is going to be a popular one, I think. One to three person. Pretty well designed in the interior. It makes a good use of space. It's relatively defendable. Um, not too large, so not a huge target. But that two to three person design size is, I think, the, the sweet spot for this game. This one's coming in at 46 meters, which is pretty good. The base version has 32 SCU. It's not really base. It's kind of like their essentials exploration variant. But I, I see this as the base. And it comes with a pretty nice radar. It comes with 32 SCU of um, storage. And it comes with space for three. What more could you want? This is this is a good ship. I don't have to say too much about it. It kind of sells itself, to be honest. Uh, everybody needs to 
upgrade at some point to a two to three person ship and this might not be yours but this is a very good one and it slots itself in pretty nicely but it won't be here till the end of the year it's got two more variants the cargo focus variant which some people really like the blue i wish they had more pictures of them i think they only really have like two or three concept images for each one and we've got the bounty hunting variant the mark this is that stealthy looking one i like this this looks clean. Hey, don't take me back there. No, take me to the other ship. So this one is actually, I think, the most interesting of all of them because this comes with a little bit more than you'd expect. It's got an EMP and a quantum uh, entanglement field, which means you're going to be able to keep people from jumping into quantum travel and you're also going to be able to shut down their ship. In terms of actual bounty hunting in the game which would you know as a crew you see that in movies sometimes this seems like the ideal ship you've got an armory on board i believe remote turret so you can defend yourself remote turret on the bottom to defend yourself even more emp and qed so you can stop your targets from getting away plenty of space on the inside so you can live on multi-day voyage voyages and prisoner transport person made um prop purpose made prisoner transport I don't think there's as much excitement around this type of gameplay as there's going to be by the end of the year. Fingers crossed, assuming that they're introducing Bounty Hunting V2. But a lot of people don't realize how much they're going to break that gameplay and make it something different than what it is now. All right, Aegis Dynamics. Let's start with the, with the, the friendliest of Aegis. A ship that many of us start out with. If you have, let me get a whoop whoop in the chat. The Aegis Avenger, specifically the Titan, is a multi-purpose absolute workhorse. One of the best starting ships you can get in the game. It's a little more expensive, so you can, technically you can upgrade to this. But a lot of people take this as their first ship and they love it for it. A lot of people keep this after being their first ship. Um, it's got a decent amount of defense. It's got a decent amount of cargo. It's got a bed on board. It's got an interior, so you're, you have some space to move around. <laughs> It's got variants that are meant for things like bounty hunting and, and um, EMP usage. This is one of the older ships in the game, but one of the better ones that they've made. It's also very small, so you can get it wherever you need to. 20 meters of length, it's personal sized. But wait, there's more. There's not actually more. I just wanted to say that. But as you can see, small size, decent amount of cargo a bed components this is all these are old pictures too they're going to update this to the gold standard and it's going to look a lot better this ship actually used to be really small compared to what it is now this got boosted up around the same time as the cutlass black both of them were much smaller than they are but it's a good ship so if you're looking for a starter ship and haven't gotten to the game check this one out there's also the eclipse this is the bomber it's pretty explanatory from the looks it looks like a bomber it's got a cool, it's got a fun trailer. Let's check it out. I just liked it because of the derp who sees his entire base get blown up because he couldn't spot a spaceship from two kilometers away. Like, imagine how close this guy must be to see that base through this scope, and they don't know he's there. In a bomber! He's like, oh, what missile? What's that?
<laughs> I bet that guy wishes he heard earlier. That's like a whole base, a loaded Starfarer, an entire Idris, <laughs> probably multiple people, all gone. One torpedo. <laughs> That's why I'm not building bases in Star Citizen. No, I'm kidding. This ship is also used, you'll find the Eclipse uh, pictures in a lot of random clickbait articles and stuff. The US has developed a new I stealth bomber. Know, yes, the Eclipse though is, again, it's a pretty niche ship. If you want, we can actually see one getting blown up real quick. This is actually a pretty cool trailer as well. This is a completely different uh, vehicle, but we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this as well. I guess technically it's getting reverse blown up. I feel like there was a missed opportunity here because in the Eclipse trailer, they had an Eclipse blowing up an Aegis, uh, Aegis Idris, right? They should have had it blowing up... Oh, there's no Anvil capital ships. They should have had it blowing up Anvil ships. Because now they have the Anvil Ballista coming in and blowing up a, uh, Eclipses. It, it, it feels like this would have been a great clapback if they had done it that way with the first trailer. Targets will never know what hit them. The Ballista from Anvil. The Ballista from Anvil. <laughs> Jesus. What'd you do to your throat, dude? Um, somebody replayed this backwards. It was pretty cool to, to see. I just want these trailers to be longer. <laughs> I like, I like sci-fi movies, you know? So that's the Ballista, and there's not really too much to say about that. Um, obviously, they're sworn rivals and enemies from the trailers, you could tell. And this one comes from Anvil, their competitor. I think Anvil was, I believe Anvil was below Aegis when the Messers fell, so Aegis got hurt a lot more and Anvil did not. That being said, they still haven't released a capital ship in the game, which is weird. Where is, where, why am I not seeing this? Oh, it's a ground vehicle, it's down here. The Ballista. Here we go. So this is an anti-air ground vehicle with missiles on it. Pretty self-explanatory. We use it for jump town, but it does have a bit of a weak spot because it can't look all the way up. Um, also, I don't think you can reload them in the field yet. I might be wrong about that. But it's not super easy to get supplies out to these ground vehicles still. Seems like it we're getting there very quickly, but for now, these are a good these are a good vehicle for like ground defense. And now that we're gonna get bases and more ground outposts and locations where we can hold down areas, this thing's gonna be useful. But I still think that the better offering is the Centurion. Yeah, no reloading yet. So this thing doesn't require a reload because it's got laser weapons. Same kind of thing. Think of it sort of similar from the Perseus to the Polaris. Obviously, this is the same size, so it's not the same comparison, but this is the laser weapons to that ship's missiles. This thing is the guns to that slobbing damage, and you can see they're meant to work together, but I think the Centurion right now is a better option because it offers you a lot more time. Um, you don't have to worry as much about supplies. And guns just work better than missiles right now. Uh, there's also the Spartan, which we saw here briefly. This is the passenger transport version. So like they're focusing a lot on both vehicles and ships. Let's see. So those are ground vehicles from a from Aegis. That was Anvil. Not getting distracted. Let's go back to Aegis real quick. 
Probably the most interesting ship that Aegis makes is the Idris because it's the main ship in Squadron 42 and probably the most advanced ship in all of the whole Star Citizen project given it's such a set piece. This is a frigate. This is the Aegis frigate. It's pretty old, but it is effective. It's got a giant railgun on the front of one of the variants. Now the other variant, I don't know what's on the front, but it's not a railgun. And it's got a internal hangar that can carry multiple ships. We've seen plenty of the Idris. We've even been on board the Idris in game. But recently in Star Citizens, I held the line trailer. We got to see a lot more of it. So let's jump into that trailer real quick because I always will take the opportunity to watch that trailer. It's freaking awesome. And look at some of the other little bits of the Idris we've seen and what it has to offer. First one, I believe, is the hangar. They actually don't show a lot of it until later on in this video. Here we go. So here's the hangar bay of the Idris. Here we're dialing in the hangar to make it as immersive and believable an experience as possible. That'll do it. Oh, done. Okay. All right. All right. For example, we're launching off a space carrier, but we still ground the feel in real world actions, refueling, repairing, and inspecting, and making sure that your next flight mission is a success. So good to keep in mind, this is still scenes from Squadron 42. It's not gonna look like this on Squadron in Star Citizen. I'm just trying to show you the ship here. It says we've captured. Let's ready some extra ice packs out of storage. Whenever gunners are on full rotation, you can always count on at least one of them getting hurt. We also have you covered in everyday life. The medical staff work diligently for their patients, whether they're players or crew. And that's that's a lot of like what they've shown. Um, We've seen a lot of this ship. Now, this here is actually the Javelin, I believe. And as somebody said in chat, the Javelin is probably the more advanced ship technically by lore. But the Idris being such a main part of the game, I think is where they're putting a lot of their design and and, and efforts into. That being said, the Javelin's also a big part, so maybe they're doing the same there. This is what the Javelin looks like. Oh, no, I'm sorry. This is still the Idris. This is the Idris bridge. My bad. I always forget that. So... Here's what the biggest the bridge that, looks like. How would they have survived? And what state of mind may they be in? We've worked closely with our social teams in delivering a cohesive social experience when you're taking some downtime from our refined flight and FPS missions, or even missions of the more eerie kind. And as was also said in chat there, the Polaris ultimately is the strongest, hmm, most advanced ship for the UEE at least until the retribution is done, because it, uh, it's the newest ship. It's not even built by the time Squadron 42 happens. That's the Idris. Um, we've also got the Nautilus, which is another interesting ship. This one has really slipped under the covers since it was revealed. And I think that's reasonable. This is a weird ship. It had a weird introduction, much like the Polaris. It was, I think it was introduced and you were only able to get it if you were at a specific event that CIG was throwing. And, uh, yeah, that was, that was one of those things. <laughs> This thing is made to be a mine layer, mine layer and a mine sweeper. They had a really cool game based on this when it did launch. Bar Citizen Germany, right? So there's three different mines. The, the homing mine, which is basically you put it out in space and it flies at a ship and blows up. The uh, gun mine, I guess. Wait, let me see. No, this is this is a drone that disables mines. And then you've got the gun mine, which has two guns that shoot ballistics or lasers at, at targets. So it's almost entirely focused on these mines.
But it also does have some weaponry to defend itself, so this is meant to be flying in a fleet. It's going to be in a war area, wartime area, but generally more on patrols and outside of natural engagement. You can see it, they're just showing concept art here if it's laying its mines. It's got two deployers, one on the top, one on the bottom. Um, the interior is very dense. The way it's designed is interesting. It's kind of diagonally designed to take advantage of that Dorito shape, even though it's not an RSI ship. It's actually not really a Dorito shape, is it? It's like a diamond almost. That's an interesting shaped ship, actually. Something smaller like this would be cool. And you can see they've got the drones here that are meant to, di to um, disable these mines. So I bet there's going to be some segments with mines like this in Squadron 42. And in Star Citizen, we'll probably have to disable mines and stuff like that. Easy job, right? Easy way to give people a beginning job that's pretty immersive. Yeah, this is super niche. Not only is this incredibly niche, but it also takes a lot of people to man. Dang, these concept images are cool, though. Again, you got more of that classic style bridge, but this time it's on the front of the ship, right up here. It's going to be cool to watch these guns in the front fire. Wow, they gave this ship a ton of concept art. Here's the uh, the gun drones or the gun mines. So you could lay 50 of them out near a space station if you need to defend that. And that would be great help when you're engaging somebody on your home turf. I wonder if you'll be able to get these mines with other drones or if you'll be able to have those drones in other ships. That'd be an interesting complication. Because you got to wonder, you know, some some people would imagine that these mines are available to a certain class of character in some other game, right? Instead of a specific ship. And they would want some other way to get these mines without having to have this ship. So it'll be interesting to see if they expand on the gameplay and bring it outside of the Nautilus. Jumping to the complete other side of Aegis's dynamic. No pun intended. We have the Reclaimer, which looks entirely different from that ship. Um, it's almost inexplicably different from all of the other Aegis ships. This thing is a industrial looking powerhouse, something you'd expect to see maybe from Drake or even possibly Misk, but it is, it, it comes from a different division of the company, kind of like how Samsung makes, I don't know, tanks and phones. It's kind of like, this is the industrial side of, of Aegis. They put a lot of time into coming up with a massive multi-purpose salvaging ship. And after how long? When was this thing released? 2016, 2017? Um, doesn't even say. Since this thing was released, it was a giant hulking useless ship. Now it's the most interesting ship for a crew in the entire game. We get like, 10 people together, two cargo ships, a bunch of people salvaging, and have just a great time with this thing. If in the space of one year, it's gone from being very boring to a very exciting ship, but it's got a ton of problems. And if you're looking for the experience, I'd find somebody who has one of these before buying one yourself, because this thing needs help. We got some really, really cool vibe setting trailers for this. The first one that we will see will remind you of Alien, funny enough. The second one we will see will remind you of Neil Blomkamp uh, and his District 9 movie. This is the scene I was thinking of. Hey, wow, it's super dark out here. Oh, yeah. Hey, look, there's lights over here, too. I don't have any horns. I need a horn for this part. Hold on, I've got some wind effects here too, look. <laughs> okay, I'm just 
give you real music. My god, now I have paper all over me. This is a horrible idea. <laughs> Why is this still here? Uh, yeah, so that was the video. I'm sorry you had to go through that, I really am. That was the first video, reminding you of Aliens. This one should remind you of Neil Blomkamp and District 19, and I don't need to make the sounds for this. They're already great on their own. No, 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 no. I'm sorry. Not District 19. Um, oh, no, that's why I'm getting mixed up. It was uh, the movie, the trailer he made for Halo. ADHD's kicking in, guys. Deal with me. Ne I'm pretty sure Neil Blomkin made a Halo trailer. Right? Wasn't this... Yeah, see? <laughs> Yo, there's no, that's not a coincidence. I think they only did that for one scene. Yeah, no, they did it here. So that was an old trailer that Blomkamp made, I think, when he was still thinking about doing a movie, but clearly they were inspired. Can we all just like picture for a second what's actually going on in this scene? This guy's literally walking across the cargo bay. Like, where are you going, dude? <laughs> There's like three feet more off screen that he could be even going to. The Claw! Y'all see? <laughs> My favorite part of this trailer is the derpy turret up here. If you watch it, it'll be shooting, and then as it's rotating, it just starts kind of shooting in different directions. <laughs> it's so funny. It just derps out. So that's a cool, it's a cool trailer again. It makes the ship look great. Um, it, it didn't play like that for a long time, but I do think that's where we're getting to finally with the multi-crew gameplay, the engineering, actual salvage being a thing. But yeah, their trailers hit hard. For good reason. They had to make a lot of money. Mr. Endomi, thank you for the sub, dude. Also three months. We have had a good three months, huh? This last quarter. It's the claw. Where are we going from the Reclaimer, folks? How about we talk about the Saber and the Saber Raven? This is, uh, I don't hear this ship gets talked about as, as much, but I think this is the best looking fighter in the game. I wish I had one. 
No, I really don't. <laughs> I wish I could fly one more often. I like the Super Hornet. But this is like a... I really like the look of this one. I guess it looks like a plane. So that's convenient because we like planes. But it's beefy. I think this is a medium fighter or is this a heavy fighter? This was Aegis's attempt to take the F-8 Lightning. No, the F-8 Lightning is their ship. The Scorpius was the attempt. No, the F-8 Lightning is Anvil. Yeah, this was... Aegis' attempt at the F-8 Lightning, while the Scorpius was RSI's attempt. I like this better than the Lightning, but um, it's it's just not the same kind of ship because they didn't win that contract. But yeah, it's officially, it's a stealth fighter. It's got this Comet skin on it. And then there's the variant that is, this is one of the only ships you can't actually get in this game. It does, it's not for sale. It doesn't come in a game package. They do not allow people to have it. The only way you could get one was either by buying an old Intel Optane drive back when they did the promotion for this ship, which I think was 2016, or um, getting the code for that off of somebody else. This one will always be locked behind that promotion and therefore it's gonna be really, really hard to get, but it exists. It's an E-War ship. It has an EMP on it. It's got a couple guns. It's not as good as a Sabre. It's not meant for combat like the Sabre, but it's got a very unique design and it is it has a unique purpose as well. And those are the two Sabre ships. About 25 meters long, $170 if you buy it for real money, no storage. But you can get it in-game, and I suggest doing so. Two EMPs, correct. Aegis Dynamics was designed to the Sabre in response to the UEE Navy's request for a proposal for a next-generation fighter. Um, but when they did this, they got beat out by the F-8 Lightning and well, this ship and the F-8 Lightning got beat out. Sorry, this ship and the RSI Scorpius got beat out by the F-8 Lightning during this little thing. So the Vulcan is one of my favorite ships in the game. And it pains me that they still haven't brought it in, but I think it's waiting for drones. It's going to be really heavily dependent on drones. And you can see that because it's the only ship that they've ever shown us that has shown drones working except for that reclaimer trailer we just saw had some of it but there are not that many drones or they're not they're not that many ships where they've shown the actual concept of the ship relying around drones the reason this is one of my favorite ships is because i think this is actually one of the biggest one of the biggest opportunities for industrial players to have gameplay like say a mole or a starfare or something like that this would be like the rearm and repair version of that gameplay I think that's a sweet spot. As I've been saying, this 40 meter length, two to three people crew size is a lot of content will be made for that style of gameplay, I think. It's too hard to get 10 to 15 people online. They're gonna be aiming for a lot of the small group gameplay. And I think the Vulcan is uniquely, uniquely situated to give that in a very unique way that other ships can't. So as you can see, They've got drones here that leave the ship and will help you to repair other ships, uh, rearm other ships, all that kind of stuff, or refuel other ships. It's an industrial workhorse with drone compartment, living quarters, space for cargo, space for you guys to fly. Now, I think it is actually meant only for two people because it's a pretty small ship, but three, maybe you could work a good job with three. Um, we don't know much about it, though, because they've been so mum about talking about it. They really haven't said anything since they introduced it because all of the gameplay surrounding this is pretty advanced. Rearming and repairing are both, you know, not even here. Refueling is barely a thing. And drones, obviously, are nowhere to be seen. But I'll show you what we have seen on this ship real quick. Specifically... I think they show, yeah, some of the interior stuff here. Let me just give you a, a little sneak peek a couple minutes we look at what they're talking about with this thing. Any of these ships could be stuck out in deep space. Uh, they can be adapted in not the, the more active combat side, but helping others, then this is a really great uh, entry into that because it does allow you to help out massively for ships that run out of fuel, ships that have minor damage ships that run out of ammo and uh, any of these ships could be stuck out in deep space uh, and they can call for your help and you can go out there and give them just enough to get them to where they need to go to it's sort of like uh, the space AA or AAA for America uh, you, you call them up 
they give you just enough to get to where you're going and then you can do your full uh, repairs, rearm, refuel there. So the mechanic for, for doing the repairing, refueling, rearming is via its drones. So it has four drones that are sort of contained within the body of the ship um, and then it can launch them out. These drones can, they can do all three actions, but they can only do one at a time before they have to go back to the, the mothership to, to change function, to take on new supplies. So whilst you've got four and they can do everything, they can't do it all together. So you can't have four out fixing everything at a time. Um, there are only two stations to control the drones. So again, it sort of keeps tabs on what it can do. It's a, it's a three person ship, so you've got one person flying and two support stations, which would be either controlling the turrets or controlling the drones. So naturally, if you're in a sort of hostile environment, you may not want to have everybody controlling the drones and leaving yourself defenseless. So you sort of got to trade off your defensive capabilities with your support capabilities. Um, Nonsense, I'm going to repair so them to death. Probably two drones at a time going out at any, at any one time doing one or two of those three features. And the extra two are just there for if you want to quickly change what you're doing. They're, they're all stocked in the ship, ready to go. You can send them out. Naturally, the, the drones will either stay where you've left them or continue on an AI behavior. Or if you're out for an extended duration of time, um, you're probably going to start losing these drones. Uh, they're, you might get damaged. You might be careless flying them around. You might, if you're trying to repair a ship, you might actually bang into it and destroy the drone. So we felt that if you only had two, and you can only use two at a time, and one gets destroyed, that's quite a harsh penalty. You sort of lost 50% of your ability to do anything off the bat. So we've got those extra two as sort of redundancies and allows you to just stay out that bit longer. Um, there's crew quarters in there, so it's not, a, it's not a, I've got a mission to go do this item, I've got to go there, come back, because I can't survive out in space. You've got your crew beds, you've got basic living quarters, basic accommodation. So we see people spending significant amounts of time out on these missions, using up their drones, using up their supplies. There's a very small cargo hold to keep supplies in there, which sort of feeds into the drones. If it's if you're carting ammo around, so, you're not physically. Oh, as ex dang it, I just messed up my camera. As exciting as that is, that's really what we know about the Vulcan. Um, Repair, refuel, rearm, use of drones, small ship, one to two person, but it's still nowhere in sight. And that's, it's the case for quite a few ships, but not as many as it used to be. They're doing a lot better at bringing ships in. We're about to jump into Drake. They've introduced a lot of Drake ships recently uh, that have helped to fill out that sort of category. The Redeemer, big favorite, specifically Astropub loves this ship. Uh, if you ever do come across the Astropub or Astro Historian as he goes by, please make sure to bring this up, ask him, you know, how he feels about it, and um, let him know that it has fans, and and they're there for him. He often feels a little bit lonely in his desire for the Redeemer, because people don't really match him in his excitement for it. But yeah, the Redeemer is a cool little gunship. It was designed by the players, actually, in a competition way back in, like, 2014, and it kept most of its design elements, but CIG went in, made it a little bit better, and, and uh, released it to the game. 330 bucks for a few turrets and a decent interior. This is another niche ship, as there are many in Star Citizen. Not everybody needs every ship, and this one's really for combat-focused folks. Long haul, though, combat-focused. You got, you got food supplies, you got beds. This is like a long-distance combat ship, which is very interesting. That's mean. <laughs> nah, man. I don't, you guys don't know what you're talking about. He loves himself a Redeemer. See, executes there. Can confirm Redeemer is Astropub's favorite ship. He confessed it to me. I feel like he says it just about every time I see him. The other ship we didn't touch on was the Retaliator. And this was one that will probably introduce modularity this year. It's got a few modules, kind of like the Galaxy. It's got cargo, dropship, living, and torpedo modules. And we've seen all of these in engine. They're not just concept images anymore. They have made these. It's just a matter of when the actual modularity functionality works. And if you go back on my Space Tomato 2 channel, I've gathered different things they've said at different times <clears throat> that essentially points to them saying modularity is finished. 
it will be introduced on the retaliator and it will happen in 2024 it's all been confirmed by cig at this point so i expect this to get a rework this year but it's a lot bigger than it looks this is like the opposite of the perseus you look at this thing and you're like okay it looks like a fighter sure i guess it looks like a file that can't be displayed but you're thinking it looks like a fighter it looks like it's got a couple space for a couple people and then like you start to look at the interior and you realize <clears throat> it's actually pretty big that's a per like this is a long ship it's uh 70 meters long i think of this thing as being around 30 to 40 meters to be honest or maybe 50. I don't think of it as a 70 meter long ship though. This is almost this this is as long as a constellation. Uh and it's just meant for bombing. So if you're a serious combat pilot and you're interested in these longer haul bigger style missions, this actually this ship is a bit of a sleeper because that style of mission isn't super in the game right now. But I think there's going to be some interesting gameplay for this thing. I don't like it. I freaking hate it. I think this is the ugliest ship in Star Citizen. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's not every ship is for everybody. I, I'm glad there's ship I don't like. What do I think of the Connie rework series of Odd Job Entertainment? I think the Connie needs a bit of a, an update, if that's what you mean. Yeah, they've shown the Retaliator's internals, and they look good. It's looking a lot better. Still pretty ugly from the outside. But yeah, it does look a lot like that bomber, the Blackbird. I mean, not the bomber. There's also the Javelin. We might as well touch on this. This is the largest ship anybody in Star Citizen can own. We can capture in Mana Bangle, but you can't own it. So this is the biggest one for reference. It is a 480 meter long ship. It weighs 11, 111 million kilograms. Uh, it takes a crew of up to 80 people, at least registered as of right now, and carries 5,400 SU of storage. This, nobody needs this ship. No single person needs this ship. This is the kind of thing that you're getting for orgs. And I think those are the only people who are going to be able to afford to run it. All this stuff we're talking about with repair and refueling and rearming and how the price of, of guns and missiles and paying people who are manning your ship and all that stuff. Imagine having to run this and firing this thing's guns and paying 80 people for three hours and repairing and paying the fuel cost of this. A ship like this won't be worth taking out for the most part. And that's where this whole push to capital gameplay starts to come in as they focus more on large scale stuff and fleets and probably org stuff. But yeah, this thing's crazy. Good luck to you, you folks who have this, and and good tidings to you. This is a $3,000 purchase, this ship. It's the most expensive single item I think you can buy. And, um, yeah. Let's hit the Cutlass series. So the, uh, the, the Cutlass is like the general Drake ship. Most popular ship in the verse, of course, the, the Vulture got it. But besides the specialized Vulture... As you can see here, the, I can't zoom in. Of course I can't. Thanks, Twitter. As you can see here, the Drake Cutlass Black is the most popular ship in all of Star Citizen, if, if you're not specializing in salvage. And then the fifth most popular is the Drake Corsair. Here's the Avenger Titan that we talked about earlier. So you can see these are very common ships. So the Drake Cutlass Black is a really popular ship for good reason. It's like the perfect upgrade from the Avenger Titan. You're going to 46 SU of cargo. You've got crew space for three. It gives you an extra turret for defense. Um, it's about 40 meters in length, so it hits that really good sweet spot of big enough to support two, multiple people and some good cargo, small enough to be relatively low key and land in a lot of places. It's got a tractor beam on the back, which is really nice. They just added that with the vehicle tractor beam so you can load stuff into the cargo hall a little bit bit easier, the cargo bay. It's got VTOL thrusters on the back that do swivel so that you can land uh, more easily in atmosphere. And it does not have a toilet, but it will someday, I think. It's a cool ship, though. And there's not really a reason to dislike it if you're looking for a general purpose ship of that size. Besides the fact that 
they didn't stick to let me look up the cutlass black original trailer here's what the ship originally looked like much like the avenger titan this thing changed a lot in size and shape when it got updated just take a moment to oh my god where's that i held the line i know it's a cinematic no actually these are both cinematics this is just the difference between their rendering of the van duel between when was this 2014 these are technically both going to be renders right because this isn't an in-game trailer well. they made for the cutlass black but look at this Bro. <laughs> oh my god. Oh sweet lord. Yeah, I really they really did it did the van duel in. Can I get a little closer shot? Maybe just a Yeah, that's a glow up, dude. Let me get a shot of this. I love how the thrusters just used to flippity flippy flop around everywhere <laughs> this style. Like, imagine the mechanics behind those things just flop. Look at that. <laughs> That's some Xeon tech. Oh god. This trailer is like the Saturday morning cartoons of Star Citizen trailers. It's it's just it's just a fun one. But look at how much different this ship used to look. Holy crap. That's crazy. Like this this thing back here is like you couldn't even get a vehicle in there. Just to give you an idea of how much they um they do reworks of these ships. Like when they do them, they really do update them sometimes. So the 600i rework could be bigger than we think. <laughs> Cutlass is ugly. Honestly, it's not a great looking ship. I think it would be a lot better if it didn't have these front things on the front. But man, this model looks a lot worse than it does now. I'll give you, I'll give it that. So that's the Cutlass Black, most popular ship in the game. I don't even know how we got here. There's also the Cutlass Red, though, and the Cutlass Blue. Uh, Cutlass Red being the medical version, sort of like an ambulance, kind of like an ambulance that's always at risk of breaking down, but you can heal and help people uh, with minor injuries in this ship. And then the Blue is meant for bounty hunting. This bad boy is going to have some bays in the back for your human samples when you capture them as we see bounty hunting coming in soon and you won't have to kill people you have to retrieve them that's what this one is made for it can also quantum entangle people so they can't quantum jump away from you 
And then there's still going to be some space for some cargo because you need your guns and your ammo and stuff like that. You got a turret too to disable ships. This is like a smaller version of the Zeus MR. So more of the beginner version of that ship we looked at earlier. All right, after the Cutlass, we've got the Corsair. This is the, one of the most popular ships. This is the most popular ships for bounties, as you guys are saying. And a great ship for one to three or four people. Again, this one fits right in that same spot as the Zeus. Kind of similar to the Spirit, the Vulcan, um, the MSR. This whole category of ships is probably going to keep expanding. And I think the Corsair is a big entry there. As you can see, plenty of space for vehicles and cargo. Plenty of weapons, both forward and sideways facing to defend you. And uh, plenty of space for people to hang out, chill. This is like one of the ideal ships for a group of a few people hanging out and running missions of all types. The only thing is it's Drake, so it's going to be a little bit less armored and not as luxury an experience as you might get from RSI or from um, Crusader or Origin or even Aegis or Anvil. But it's a good ship. And I think it gets the job done for whatever people are using it for. It's supposed to be an exploration ship, believe it or not. Yeah, expedition focused, but you saw all those guns. <laughs> people like to say you are exploring other folks' cargo bays. Yeah, this one does get a little bit more Star Wars-y. Partially because the wings are standing up. It really makes some callbacks to those ships. But it's a good ship. Great. Again... Perfect upgrade potential from the Avenger Titan to the Cutlass Black to the Corsair as you add one more person onto each ship. And you get a little bit more cargo each time with 72 SU on this, but it's 250 bucks, so a little bit higher. Let's go back to that Avenger Titan and theorize that maybe we're all a bunch of f***ing Drake sluts, you know? Maybe we just can't get off the, the, the Drake hype and we want to start with something else that comes in that class but isn't isn't quite so Aegis-y. Ew, gross, Aegis. The Cutter. I don't know why I didn't start with this. The Cutter is... Man. I wonder if they're going to do this with every company. The Cutter is the perfect predecessor to the Cutlass. Cutlass is the per perfect predecessor to the Corsair, and the Corsair will just theorize that you're going to jump to the Kraken from there. But the Cutter is the small version of your Cutlass or your Corsair. It's the same size around as Avenger Titan, same cost, just about for 45 bucks standalone, 20 meters in length, 4 SU of storage, it's a starter ship, but it's very new, so it's updated with all the nice light switches, door switches, uh, components are ready to go, it's compact, it's got VTOL thrusters so you can land on planets pretty easily, and it's got enough space for a small vehicle in the back. This is arguably the best choice for a solo player in the game right now just based on price and capability but as more more kind of benefits come online remember this is also competing with that 100i which has unlimited fuel with the refinery so you kind of got to pick and choose what you like the most vtol thrusters good space for a small vehicle solid but you're also going to be stopping for fuel a lot and you're going to have lighter armor and drake and that's the point of all these different companies having different ships as they handle different strengths this one's a good one i've used it quite a bit i like it ugly as a brick that's part of the charm you're like come here you stupid ugly cutter ah come here you there's a couple of variants of this that they've introduced over the last year too they've introduced the cutter scout which is an exploration focused version of this. It's got a scanning station as well as a scanning dish on top. I am rather peeved about this ship because they introduced it. <laughs> Actually, let me just show you how they introduced it so you can understand my frustration. As somebody who exploration is my first go-to for this game, it's what I've been waiting for. It's what I try to cover and always struggle to do so because it never quite catches on. They like talk about exploration and then they back off and stop talking about it for a long time. Here is how they introduced to us the Cutter Scout and why I was so frustrated when they did so. But that being said, the Cutter Scout and the Cutter Rambler are both, I think, good additions to this game for future gameplay, just not for right now. And we'll talk about that a little bit after this. The future of scanning, if people are interested in hearing about that. See, at this point, we should have said, we're only interested if, if that future is 
laid out. Unfortunately, while they said a lot of other things were coming to the game at certain points in the next 12 months, they didn't say anything particularly about scanning, just the cutter. So I don't know what the story is with this, but here's how they kind of laid it on. So what is the future of scanning? We'll touch on it lightly. At the moment, there are two main ways for you to interact with the scanning gameplay loops. The first one's obviously the scan, and the second one's the ping system. Both of these are going to be merged into a single system known as a scan wave. When you send a scan wave out, if you get any successful pings, what will happen is it will immediately populate your HUD with an AR marker, giving you information about what you've been able to scan, as well as starting to give you far more interesting information than you get now, rather than just the name of the ship. The underlying system will work on the signature system, similar to what it does today. And there are two main scans. There is the quick scan. The quick scan is just a low version of it. It has a very small impact on your own signal output. So if you want to stay a little bit more covert and potentially not be seen, looking at something you shouldn't, you can use that one instead. The main benefits are small increase to your actual passive detection range, as well as being able to detect things that maybe are a little fainter than you should be able to see. This has a decent amount of cutting through interference, but not phenomenal. The other version is the charge scan. The charge scan is the big scan. Now, this will actually allow you to detect things up to quantum boost range, which is way, way further than the current passive detection range. And not only that, but it'll actually drop a marker allowing you to jump straight to that location for whatever it is that you found. <laughs> now, you, you don't want to be jumping in blind. And as I said, it's going to give you way more information than it did before. Some examples, but not limited to this, are things like whatever it is, is it charging a quantum drive? Is it firing? Is the shields generating? Does it have any shields? Is it perhaps charging an EMP? Maybe it's got a snare up trying to catch you. It gives you that additional information so you can make the decision whether you actually want to get to that location. That's just a brief glimpse into the future of scanning and what our vision is for it. Right now, the Cutter Scout is actually in 321. So there's the like, super jarring jump. <laughs> We're like, yeah, so this is scanning. This is how it's going to work in the future. This is what we're thinking. And then there's a ship. All right, cool. On to the next ship. And I'm just like, well, I think they should have just not said anything about scanning. That personally soured my mood on the, the scout. But I do think it's a good ship. And I'm looking forward to when this gameplay does work, testing this stuff not only on the scout, but on other ships. Um, it's a lot like the normal uh, cutter. It's just got a little bit of space taken up for a radar. And then there's also the Rambler, which is kind of like the Mustang Beta in that it's a little camper van. You can just take out places and, and do stuff with. <clears throat> Besides that in Drake, we've got the Buccaneer. It's a little rambunctious little fighter. It's scrappy for sure. Um, it's got gigantic thrusters on the back. It reminds me a lot of the ship from Starcraft that turns into like a little mech when it lands. But it's a single person, I think medium fighter possibly, with a decent amount of weaponry. It's got that Drake appeal of a little bit more than it needs. Yeah, one person ship, small interdiction focus, they call it. 15 meters in length. Pretty tiny. Okay, Drake Herald. Man, that's a beautiful picture. This looks like Raul. Who took this? Rylinks. Welcome. Good job. Uh, the Herald is a, a wart of a ship, if you will. It's based around data management, data hacking, transmitting. It's it, literally, it's just, it's a little thing, like a lump with a massive couple thrusters on the back. This thing is made to just go in a straight line and get people data when they need it. Um... It's cramped on the inside, it's very purpose-built, it's very utilitarian, and it's very much useless right now because it is so focused on data. And data as a commodity is not going to be in the game for, I think, at least a couple of quarters. Maybe 323, but I really highly doubt that. Um, that being said, 
If the star map comes in, they do need to have waypoints, which would include data as a commodity. So we very well might have more use for a ship like this soon, but I don't think ships like this will become useful as soon as we get data, if that makes any sense. Kind of like how we got docking, but you still can't really dock with all ships yet. So yeah, this is more of a long-term kind of ship. There's not really much reason to have this now. Uh, it's an easy $85 pickup. It'll probably go up in price when it's specialized because this will be a useful ship at some point. But for now, it's not. It's EMP protected, which is cool. It's got armor and it's got a broadcasting array. But there's really not much to it. Won't see data as a commodity until 4.x. Right, and I think that still could be this year. I think they're aiming for it to be this year. It is the ship of choice for the race on Orison. Okay, okay, okay. Not useless. Then. Is it actually faster than anything else in the game? I don't know if it's the fastest ship in the game, but it's up there. It used to be. It's hitting 1,361 meters per second. That might be the fastest. The old Kraken. I like the Kraken trailer. I like the Kraken trailer literally just for the opening scene. Because it just gives such a cool look of the Star Citizen verse. The Kraken is a carrier ship. It's not a frigate. I mean, I don't think they call it a frigate. It's a literal carrier. Yeah, they call it a light carrier. This thing is all about... It's, a, it's an aircraft carrier in space. I mean, look at it. It's even got the look. So here's kind of a look at what it's meant for. Not that you're supposed to just go and mob on a single miner with a giant ship like this, but... It just gives you the idea. See, this scene is dope. Oh yeah, Kraken was the defender. You're right, you're right. So I guess I don't know if you should be defending a single miner with a Kraken either. <laughs> I think this was also actually a really cool part of the trailer. Just easily set the vibe of being a lonely miner out here just digging away at some little deposit amongst all the asteroids. Time has come for something new. Something to change the game. When seeking fortunes at the fringes of civilization, you need someone you can trust. In this age of uncertainty, it's time to take back your strength. It's time to Release the Kraken. Drake Interplanetary. Ram them. We got your back. We got your back. Drake Interplanetary. We got a cool name. So Drake's a, it's a cool ship. Um, this is another one of those ones that's going to depend on a lot of different gameplay systems to work and people to work together to make them work. Dang, why are you doing this to me? Just let me view the pictures. There we go. 
and it's really focused on carrying ships. There's a lot of internal structure here, but the main purpose is to care for, refuel, repair, rearm, and, and maintain ships on the open deck. I mean, there's obviously some risk to using a ship like this as opposed to an interest. You get more spaces, but people can hit ships that are on the deck. But it's a cool ship. It's very big. Massive. Um, 270 meters long, 1600 freaking dollars. I'm more interested in the Kraken Privateer. And this is actually more of a Banu Merchantman, but for humans. This is also a carrier. Also carries plenty of cargo, actually much more at 768 SCU. And also has a pretty decent sized crew of 1 to 10. $2,000 though to cost. 270 meters in length. And it's got a lot of internal structure that's more based around hosting shops, selling things, and creating a general goods, almost like a mall in a spaceship. Yeah, it'll be more than one to 10. Um, you're, you're supposed to be inviting vendors to set up shops here and literally sell stuff on your ship. And then you basically take that landlord tax as they bring in customers to your ship. That kind of it's it's similar to the Banu Merchantman in gameplay. And in my opinion, that's some of the hardest stuff that they've talked about doing. I don't know how they're going to make it so that you got NPCs and players boarding your ship, buying stuff and leaving and just making sure all that money system works. But that's the idea behind this ship. And you can see from the concept images that there's a lot of kind of building to this idea of the haggling in the open floor space. The freaking bridge is huge. See, they're like one to ten people crew. And you can see here you got one, two, three, four. It's probably another one, five, six seats on the bridge. So how in the world are you supposed to have a ship with landing pads and repair stations and and six seats on the bridge and then say we only need ten people? <laughs> That's nuts. But this, this ship is huge. Look at this. The inside looks like the Idris. It looks like a Drake version of the Idris. This is probably another one that's going to be a little while because they're going to have to figure out some systems to make this work. But it looks cool. It looks like a much more rudimentary kind of dark and grungy version of the capital ship experience if that's what you're looking for. Again, hopefully... They have NPC Krakens flying around that you can be the crew for, that you can run missions on without having to fly it. Um, we've also got the Caterpillar. This is actually a sneakily very, very, very valuable ship. How much is this? 330 bucks. I think that kind of matches it. This is actually a modular ship. The, the, the side with the command module detaches as a spaceship, much like the Endeavor. And then these sections up here all can be changed into different types of modules. So this thing in the future is going to be a powerhouse for gameplay. Um, you've got cargo modules, but I do think they're going to have other modules you can swap in that are probably going to be very useful. So the Caterpillar is a great ship. It's a good cargo ship. It's got 576 SCU of cargo. It only requires two to three people to run it very well. 111 meters long. Solid choice from Drake. Um, I believe that's it for Drake. So let's do Anvil real quick. We're going to fly through Anvil. We got the Hornet series. These fighters are a solid choice, but they're relatively old. For anybody who gets confused as to how this works, this is the F7C. If you go back to the... I held the line trailer... And you look at these first ships that we see in the beginning of that trailer. They look much better than this ship. Come on, buddy. You can do it. Come on. Just load. Almost there. There you go. Okay, so this... This is, as you can see here, the F7A. Anvil ships are categorized by civilian and, uh, uh, I don't know, attack, <laughs> military. The A series are all military, C series are civilian. So the F7C, this, 
is just the civilian version of this. As you can see, this looks a lot more nice and smooth and stuff. This is what we get. And there are a few different models of this. There is the Hornet, the Super Hornet, which is, I have that. The Hornet Tracker, which is based on scouting. And the Hornet Ghost, which is a stealth variant. All of these are in the game. They don't really vary that much because of the gameplay, but they are choices that you can get. 28 meter long fighters with no cargo, one to two pilots. It's two on the Super Hornet. If you got a friend the Super Hornet, it's good because you got an extra seat. There's also the Pisces. This is a huge crowd favorite and arguably one of the better starter ships in the game. This is the smallest way in the entire game you can carry three people. You've got two jump seats here and a pilot seat up front. So you have space for cargo and transport for three people in a very, very small footprint. And that's going to be valuable more and more in this game. This thing pairs with the Carrick and acts as its runabout, but it's perfectly fine on its own with a quantum drive. And I use it a lot as a little get around ship. For SU of storage, 45 bucks to buy, 16 meters long. You can get starter packs with this. This is one of the best ways to start the game with the Pisces. This thing competes with the other ships we saw, like the Cutter. Um, there's also the medical variant, which is not much different, but it sacrifices that SCU for the ability to heal people as another ambulance, kind of like the Cutlass Red. If I can find a shot of the interior. So yeah, you've got a medical bed. You can get some small time injuries healed there and do a lot of maintenance work. But really, this is going to bring them back to the Carrick for the more serious injuries, which the Carrick also has a more serious um, hospital medical clinic. So if it's too serious for the Pisces, you just fly them all the way back. No bed in the eight in the C8X Pisces, yes. And I think that's because if they put the a bed in the C8X Pisces, then there would be no reason to get the 100i, even though it does have that refinery system. Like I said, the 100 series is about the same size as this, but it sacrifices a little bit of SCU and instead gets a bed. So they both got their trade-offs. Like we said, the cutter, the Pisces, the Aurora, the 100i all have different things that make them better or worse. And while this is the smallest thing that you can go with uh, three people in, the 100i and 135 are some of the smallest you can get cargo and beds into. So trade-offs, but this is a great ship. The Carrick is a much bigger ship. This is kind of what you're driving towards when you get that Pisces. Um, that's my whole player, new player's guide. This recent one was get a Pisces, work your way up to a Carrick. And maybe somebody has, I don't know. But this is a good ship to work towards. You got 500 SU of storage, 456. Uh, this is a great ship if you got like three to four or five friends that you want to go out with. Two turrets on the side so people have things to do. Engineering will definitely be a thing. You got a medical station. Um, you got a... A vehicle bay for your vehicles. You got a hangar for the ships up top. You've got a mess hall to eat. You got plenty of storage down below, beds for everybody, storage for everybody. This ship is arguably the best multi crew ship in the game right now. Just off of everything that it can support. It is a little bit annoying. It doesn't have its drones. That is something else it will have though. Uh, and the cargo compartments down in the bottom don't detach as they're supposed to. So it's not as easy to use. But this is a great three to six person ship and um, you can do a lot with it. We use it a lot for mobile spawn points and general org gameplay. Legionnaire. This is a boarding ship. I actually think of it as a hacking ship, but it's really not. It just uses hacking. Mainly this is focused on forced boarding operations. So any ship can board. Well, most some ships can board. <laughs> and when they do, they have to call in for a request to board, right, to dock with something else, and then they get that request and they can do it. This ship has a hacking ability so that it can hack into the other ship and force it to accept your docking, and you can connect, and your people can board. It's got a dropship module, so you can also use this as a dropship, but it's got um, a hallway that connects and has deployable armor so that people can progress through the hallway on board the ship that you're trying to get onto. They have one picture of it and they're not showing it. Where is that picture? That's weird. There's a picture of the interior of people boarding. 
essentially you'll fight your way down this hallway and board a ship. There's deployable shields and all that kind of stuff. This is an interesting type of gameplay that, again, is pretty niche. Not many people are going to be getting this ship. But at uh, 120 bucks, it is something to think about if that's the gameplay you're into. 32 meters long, so keep in mind it's a little larger. Crucible. This is like the large version of the Vulcan. This is the ship that will do all the repair and refueling and rearming of any ship you need, even if it's big. It can kind of have itself collapse like this, so it's just flying around to sort of find big ships to repair. But it can also have this big module in the middle here that allows ships to land on it and get repaired themselves. So you can see they're even doing some of that with the with the module attached. Um, but these are old pictures, so stuff will change from this. But you can see it's a multi-deck repair focused ship that will have a lot of visibility. There's like this weird cockpit on the top that has visibility in all directions almost. And you can look down on the ship as you're repairing it. This is a very cool ship. This will be a probably a big money maker too because of the repair costs and stuff. You'll have to do shipments of materials in and out of this. Ships will be coming in and docking with you. There's a lot of gameplay surrounding the Crucible. So for those industrial players, this could be a great, great place to go. Uh, 3D8 crew, 230 SCU for all those materials you might need and 90 meters long. Good multi-crew ship. Liberator. Here's one that I expected to be in the game by Pyro. And I think they wanted this to be in game by Pyro because they've talked about how Pyro will be so big It'll be so hard to refuel. You're going to need more ships to carry you around. And that's all this ship is made for. This is literally just a, a ferry boat. You can carry tanks on it. You can carry other ships on it. You can go long distances. You can quantum travel. You can carry supplies, rearm, refuel. Um, all sorts of facilities to be able to carry out logistics operations. This will be another popular one for orgs. You can see a lot of the vehicles that we're looking at today are not even supposed to really be considered by solo players that much. Solo players might want to be on board them or might want to take part in them. But I think it's good to get into the mindset that if you are a solo player and you're not running or taking big parts in an org, it might be a, just a better idea to use other people's ships instead of buying these for yourself. Because at the end of the day, even if you are a solo player who wants a lot of people to play with, if you do join a big org and you want them to use your ship, you're going to end up running into complications when maybe somebody in that org wants to use the ship when it's not available. At which point you might have to say, okay, I don't want the org to use this ship. But then you might not get to use it because all the people you play with are in the org. So it's always good to consider how these big ships are actually going to factor into the game and how many of them really do require a lot of people to be around. We might have to be those people. And I know people will say NPC crew and AI blades, but I would think that's more of a minority solution, to be quite honest. I think a lot of people are going to like having people around and prefer to have at least some people around. Uh, this one also looks defendable, though. As you can see, it's got turrets and deployable ships is kind of an obvious one. Man, the engineering section looks cool. It's a cool ship. I like the interior. Anvil has some pretty awesome designs, but I like the more mid-sized ships, and they don't do too many of those. The one they do is the Valkyrie. Valkyrie is an interesting dropship that I feel like gets tread on a little bit by the, um, the more all-purpose Legionnaire, but I think this thing is bigger. 48 meters in length. 30 SCU, crew of 1 to 5, but it also has a huge drop pod area down below. Let's see if I can find it. Yeah, so you got two versions of this. You have one on this side and one on the other side. So you can carry like 20 people in this thing. Um, you can quick drop. It's pretty defendable with its turrets and guns. You got turrets on the side as well. Uh, it's got that nice sort of alien mixed with Halo vibe to it. And it's got VTOL thrusters, obviously. Every single dropship should have VTOL thrusters so they can hover effortlessly in atmosphere. But it's a pretty standard dropship. If you're into that sort of military style of gameplay, this could be something you're more interested in. But it's, once again, kind of a nicher ship. Nicher. Terrapin is the turtle. How many turtle fans I got in chat? We love this ship, man. This ship goes hard. Um, 
Oh, is that why I used to have a Super Hornet? This ship is a absolute monster. It's meant to be a heavy, heavy armored tank of an exploration ship. Meant to go out into deep space and pathfind. Um, VTOL thrusters for easy flight on planets. Extra thick armor. Like this thing has heavy armor. The same thing as large ships. So this thing can take some hits. It's also got special armor for toxic environments and bad atmospheres as that exploration style of ship. It's got a special cooling mechanism so you can actually lift up your armor and move it out of the way. And little vents will let more and more heat off your ship. Once heat is a thing, that'll make more sense. But right now, it is it, it does that animation. It doesn't carry any cargo, but it is solid for exploration. And it has a massive scanning suite on top that's supposed to give you some good range and ability to find interesting stuff, depending on what that is. Yeah, a medical variant of this would be really cool. An ambulance. A terror ambulance. I love this ship, though. This was one of my first real favorites in Star Citizen. And it's actually... I bought this ship when it came out. I bought this overpriced thing. And I think it was probably the last or second to last ship I ever bought. I can check out the trailer for it real quick. It's not very long. Look at that successful scanning face. It's kind of funny because the ship is a pathfinder, so it's not exactly the op the mission it would be on, but... Um, like I said, there is a lot of internal space lost with this ship. It needs some help. It needs a rework, so... It's... Like, look at this. There's so much space in here. It's a cool ship, and it's going to be great for, like, doing deep space exploration and stuff, but... This one will have to go through a rework before it's really useful. And obviously it's very expensive for what it does. 220 bucks for really not doing anything right now. Except maybe giving you good missile to ram with. We've also got the Arrow from Anvil. This is a light fighter. Uh, not particularly noteworthy other than the fact that it's one of the metas for fighting. At least it used to be. Very light, very maneuverable. One person's ship at 75 bucks to buy. Sort of your beginner's dogfighter. The Hawk. Bounty hunting ship. This is one that's going to take a step up here shortly because we've seen it getting reworked for bounty hunting coming up soon. It's got a little seat in the back where you put your targets and then they get shoved up into the butt of the hawk and you go and take them back and turn them into jail and get paid the goods and wear your trench coat and yeah. Harrison Ford. All that jazz. We got the Argo MPUV. This is the ship that's meant to help load like the Hull Sea and other large ships like that. And it's like a small workhorse kind of ship. This isn't really something that you buy if you're just looking to play the game. This is like... Very purpose built. $40 to buy. Cheaper than a lot of ground vehicles. Uh, the Mole comes from the same company as you can tell with the orange color. We all like orange. This is your three to four person mining ship, multiple mining turrets. We do we use this a lot for gameplay, um, but you don't mine from up here. You only fly from up here, and that throws a lot of people off. It's got living quarters, 
beds and spunky crews ready to go. I like the mole. I think that they've done a good job of making this more useful over the last year for sure. And it's a lot more reasonable to have now than it was in the past. 315 bucks to buy though is a hefty ask. 45 meters in length means you don't need to. You could just find someone who has one. The raft is their cargo kind of variant of the mole. It's not actually a variant, but it's the same similar size ship, I think. 39 meters, orange color, VTOL thrusters, exposed heat exchangers. You know, the Argo works. You got the caution pattern. And the interesting thing about this is the crane system holding three 32 SU boxes in the back. The crane doesn't work yet. And it is interesting that they're using a crane instead of tractor beams, but we'll have to see how this ship is easier to load than other ships since it has this quick loading mechanism. The idea of the raft is, is that it's just supposed to be much faster than other ships when it comes to getting in and getting out with cargo. Weird thing about it is, as with every ship, they advertise it in combat. I don't know why. I guess combat sells. It's just funny to me. When you have like the most civilian type of ship and then it's firing its guns. Not even in defense, it's not even like it's flying away firing its turret. It is charging at someone shooting its forward-facing lasers. That's funny to me. So the Mustang Omega is the exclusive actually that I talked about with AMD on the podcast yesterday with Lone Vault Wanderer. If you haven't seen that, go check it out. That's kind of a talk with somebody who covers regular games, Starfield, Fallout Bethesda, a lot of Bethesda stuff he covers. Um, and he had a pretty strong reaction to this $48,000 game package that the, the media was kind of blowing up. He joined me on the podcast yesterday and we had a good talk and um, we were talking about ships available in the game. This was one of the ones I brought up as being a ship you can't buy. I think there's only two, this and the Raven and maybe one other one, but there are other variants of this ship that you can use as starters, the Alpha, Beta, and I want to say Charlie, but I think it's Gamma, and Delta. These are all pretty standard starter ships. This is a $30 ship on its own, so easy to pick up, 21 meters in length. Single person kind of fighter is a solid ship to try out, but not one that you're going to upgrade to. If you're already in the game, you're probably not going to take this. Um, it's, a, it's a cool ship. I actually like the styling of this quite a bit, and it can get the job done, but you're going to work past this pretty quickly. The interesting thing about this and the Aurora though, are they both store cargo externally. So don't be turned off by the lack of an interior. All right, another ship from CNOU, really the only other ship we have from them is the Nomad. And this is sort of a monolithic, uh, looks a lot like another ship from ED people talk about. Can't remember what it is, but Os the, not the Osprey, not the Odyssey, the, uh, something i can't remember it's it's a bit monolithic looking though the asp that's it the pioneer's not in game yet it's a bit monolithic but it's also very interesting in that it stores its its cargo on the outside too it has a deployable ramp so you can easy access that cargo and it has a tractor beam up here that easy this thing is going to be so so much better than a lot of small ships for cargo hauling you won't even have to land to load this thing that tractor beam Plus the external cargo makes this probably one of the fastest ships to load and unload and getting in and out of outpost delivery missions with the Nomad is going to be keen. So I think this is a great ship for a newcomer to upgrade to, possibly even instead of a Cutlass Black if they're really looking to keep it one person instead of two or three. It's also got a couple of guns on it so it can defend itself and it's got living quarters so you can go long distance for multi-day trips. Great ship comes in at an $80 standalone price, which I actually think is very good for what you're getting. I would I would argue this is the ship that somebody could take maybe if they wanna get into cargo, but don't wanna be hauling as much as say a, a Hull A. Hull A is I think $15 more and is gonna be a little bit more dangerous to haul with. This thing coming in at 19 meters gives it a decent size. 24 SU, one crew. I like it. I suggest this ship to a lot of people. The last ship though that from CNOU is the one that's not released yet, that is the Pioneer, and this is going to be used for base building. This is a behemoth of a ship. I mean, it looks like a base, right? This thing looks like it landed down as a base, and 
something they've said about these ships from Consolidated Outland is that capital ships from this company are specifically made to look like space stations. And as they build out more ships from this company, I expect to see a couple other large ships that do follow that sort of design language, but you can really get a sense of that same sort of monolithic structure from this. A little bit more... misc than the Nomad, but this thing's styling will be getting updated too. And I can real quick show you what they've said about the Pioneer recently, because it is... oh. <laughs> It is a large ship, and it's a ship based around base building, so it's kind of hard to know what's going to be happening with it. Here is the most recent news we've received, though. So this development on this system is starting this quarter, from what they've said. So from here, you've got the tools. So this is what we would consider a surveyor. Um, with this, we want to actually cater to everybody's play style, whether you're solo or in an org. With this, you've got different buildings that you can produce, from small, medium to large to extra L or XL. So with the surveyor tool, you can only build the small buildings. With a vehicle, you can build small and medium-sized buildings. With the Galaxy, you can build small to large structures. And then, obviously, with the Pioneer, Pioneer can do it all, and it still works as a mobile base, and we'll uh, talk about some of the more expanded features that we're adding to it in, in later on. So, um, and then it's also... In, in some year. <laughs> the Pioneer's still going to be a while away, even though it's in this presentation. I don't think we're getting it for a long time, but it will be a kind of a mobile base and a way to ba build bases as well for orcs. This is another one of those game, this ships that's like, this is for groups. This isn't for solo players. Even if you were a solo player and you bought a Pioneer, really the only way you're going to make money is building bases for other people. So you're going to probably have to hire them anyways. Um, this is definitely a group kind of... a group sort of thing. All right, let's touch on Misk ships. The Odyssey. I love the Odyssey. This ship gives me Prometheus vibes. Of all the ships in this game... This feels like the distinct exploration ship in my mind. Um, it's a really cool ship, but we don't have too much going on with it. We just know that it's a deep space exploration ship with a lot of industry leaning features. It can defend itself with turrets. It's got refinery and fuel services on board. It's got medical compartments on board. It has a mining laser so it can replenish itself and then refine that stuff. And it's all around just a very 70s 80s sci-fi looking kind of ship in my opinion it's chunky but in the right kind of way i love this ship i can't wait to see it in game but i think it's a far ways away big ship four to six crew they say could be more than that 250 cargo 700 dollars to purchase holy crap 140 meters long so you got a lot of ship out of it at least but because it's so specialized you're gonna have to wait more to see just how it hands out. Reliance series is one we haven't talked about, but this is another starter ship that's coming in around the $95 price. Actually, not too much of a starter. Um, the base model is $65, so that's better, but still the price of a normal game. I would not really... This is barely a starter ship. Like, you're getting out of the range at that point. This is... I think competes with the 100i in terms of price. I would say anything below 80 is probably good, but even then, you're getting kind of high. Now this ship is interesting because it transforms sideways to vertically. Pretty sure I've got a clip of that happening here I can show you. And it's like, it's just a small ship. There's nothing incredibly um, mention worthy about this other than that it just, it can carry one to two people and it looks interesting. I think that transformation is way too fast. I think they gotta work with that, but it's a, Definitely a cool B-Wing looking ship. It gives you some interesting vibes. Obviously that transformation is very cool. You go from sitting one above the other person in flight mode to sitting side by side, um, which is a novel experience. But the ship has been relatively rough for a while and a little bit broken a, a long time ago. So it had a rough sort of lifetime and it needs a rework. 
but it runs with that same omnidirectional technology that runs in some of the Aopoa and Mirai ships. This is also a benefactor of the Xi'an partnership between Misk and Mirai, so this ship will probably have a little bit more going for it in terms of maneuverability whenever they get around to specializing it and figuring out master modes. The Expanse. Great series. Good books, good show. But also, an interesting ship. This is your starter refining ship. Another one that kind of misled me in terms of size. I thought this was a large, large ship, but if you look at it, it's only 35 meters in length. Which is shorter than the Retaliator. Well, way shorter than Retaliator. Um, honestly, 35 meters is like shorter than the Spirit. 35 meters. How long is the Hawk? It's probably like 27, 28. Oh, okay, it's zero meters long. Good to know. That's That makes sense. <laughs> All right. How long is the Defender? 24 meters. So this thing is not much longer than the Defender, to be honest. That's, that's quite interesting. The Raft. 39. So this thing's shorter than the Raft and the Mole. But the, the refineries on this are not as big as the Arastra. And are meant to work on a smaller scale. So you bring it in, you probably, this is like you have three prospectors or a couple of moles and you're working a bunch of mining um, on a planet. You have this thing in orbit over the planet and it's just acting as a refinery stop. Very cool industrial focus ship. I actually think refining is gonna be the main version of industrial gameplay I'll get into besides cargo hauling. Like, I'm going to stick to exploration and data management for the most part when it comes to my gameplay, but refining does seem really interesting since you're sort of a go-between. You're like a, a link in the industrial cycle. I guess we could touch on the Freelancer. Another crowd favorite. This one has been around for a while. The Freelancers have gotten a couple of updates throughout their lifetime. Uh, it's a series of four different ships meant for different purposes. The original base model is kind of general purpose. The Dur is your exploration with a higher duration. Max with higher capacity at 120 SCU of capability of carrying, and the Miss, which is a combat and missile focused boat. All of these ships specialize a little bit in their own way, but they run off the same chassis, a chassis that people like, but has like not the best view out the front, which I guess Miss ships are kind of known for. I don't think they have a shot of the interior here, but the the ex the interior of the ship, looking out of it, it's like looking at a mailbox. You can kind of see it's not it looks thinner when you're actually sitting there um but it still sticks to that sort of nice misc cockpit it makes it feel very gives it kind of a large ship vibe on a small ship like this looks like a bridge rather than just a cockpit which i've always liked great ship to upgrade to competitor with the cutlass black 66 scu of cargo one to four crew storage 38 meters in length actually coming around the same size as the expanse there's one more. The Starfarer also dips into that sort of making you feel like you're on a bridge feeling when you're in the cockpit. I guess this is a fairly large ship though, so it makes sense. Here we go. So this is what the cockpit looks like. The bridge, you got two, two people up front maintaining the ship and a cockpit sitting, or the captain sitting in the back here. This ship is meant for refueling and transferring fuel really it's got massive fuel pods on the back that you can store in and this will be a big big for trading and also for refining all right jump into Asperia. Asperia has um a specialty of working on ships that aren't human but are historically endangered and they look work on remaking them in a one-to-one -one aspect made for humans so you got the talon which is the light fighter comes from the tavaran people who we stomped in a couple of different wars after they attacked us and um, kind of brought into the UEE to live with us in a way. It's not, not incredibly a great story, uh, but it's a cool ship. They have some cool looking stuff, nice technology, very bird looking, very different from human stuff. And I mean, it's worth trying out if you're into light fighters, but it, it, this is an earning game kind of ship. 24 meters in length, 115 bucks, one person, no storage. Next one up is the Prowler, and this is the drop sip version of that. That last one I showed you also has a variant for missiles, but this is the next ship that they really make, and this is a drop ship made for stealth. Um, 
it's very cool on the inside it's all standing you're not sitting as one of these dropship pilots you're getting in getting out getting dropped quickly you've got shields on the doors on both the back and the sides you've got a turret gunner on the bottom deck who can help defend the ship as well as a pilot on the top who's flying you can see people are standing getting ready to drop there are doors on the side of the ship here with air shields so you just jump right out the side of the door you can see and you get into combat it's got deployable armor on the wings so when it's up and flying you see the wings are up like this but when it lands the wings fold down and deploy armor for you as well as provide VTOL lift so that this thing can hover and these little things on the side here are actually meant to be hov pads hover pads so that this thing can go and land on capital ships and just kind of hang out on the side of a ship with this sort of proximity thing here. I don't know how well that's going to work, but this is an interesting ship. Obviously, they go for very bird-like styling with the Tavarin and um, rather spindly, more angular designs. A cool ship, but way too expensive and very niche for what people need. 440 bucks for just this little drop ship and uh, 34 meters in length. We've also got some replica ships from the Van Duel which have not been updated yet. Um, I don't know if the replica ships will be updated to the new style or not, but the current ones look like the very old Van Duel style ships. And these ships are coming from the main antagonist of the game, the Van Duel. These people do not like us. They're not even people. They be lizard folk. They're the ones that we saw earlier the, with the glow up. These are their ships. This is what they will be looking like when they're updated, more organic and liquidy looking. But the replicas, I'm not sure how those will change with the Spiria. And you can see all these replicas here. Oops, that was the glaive. Here is the scythe. It's kind of a one-sided glaive almost. It's only got one wing on the side and then the other side is just a, a gun. And we have the blade, which actually is in a sort of intermediate 2.0 phase in between the two. So you can see it's a little different from both the updated models and the old replicas. But all will be updated soon enough. I think I might actually finish with Crusader, guys. This has gone very long and I've tried to touch on all the ships I can, but uh, <laughs> I got to go eat lunch and work on these videos and stuff. We got other content to put out for y'all. So Crusader is focused on moving things. They are, they started out as a cargo moving company, but they also focus on data and apparently large guns. They made these ships called the Ares. And um, these are focused on just hitting hard with a small ship. It's basically a ship built around a gun. And you'll notice that a lot of Crusaders ships and things are named after gods and constellations. No, that's RSI. But this is a cool ship. It's a heavy hitter. A lot of people like it, but it's again, very niche. Not one that many people need. 250 bucks for a 27 meter ship with a one crew rating and no cargo storage. You're gonna really wanna know you wanna shoot people with this. One's got a laser. The other one's got a massive Gatling gun. Both of them very fun to use. I prefer this one. I think it looks better too. Spirit series, my favorite of which is the, the C1. But many people have many different favorites. This is a beloved series already. Looks a lot like the Normandy from Mass Effect and provides a lot of similar experiences. Carrying vehicles, going on exploration voyages, flying around looking absolutely banging. You can fit vehicles in here as well as plenty of cargo storage, but it is a fairly big ship for what it provides. And that's something to consider. You probably don't want to try and min-max everything in Star Citizen. You want to try and find what works for you. This ship is not the most efficient, but I think it works when it comes to things like looks, what it does provide, and the overall experience that it, that it gives. And there are other ships like that for other people. Don't always go for the ship that makes the most sense in, in terms of numbers. These ships will move around. Go for the ship that makes you feel the best. Have the most fun. And that's what this does for me. There's also the E1 and the A1, the E1 being meant for luxury passenger transport and still not quite out yet, but should be coming out to introduce probably that type of gameplay, essentially cargo boxes with feelings. But cargo transport or passenger transport will be a thing. And then there's the A1, meant to transport bombs, small bombs, 
size five bombs, but bombs nonetheless. And right now you can't even drop them like this. I hate that they reveal this sort of stuff, but at some point you will be able to just like carpet bomb with these things, which is kind of cool. That is the little, little, little friend, the little sibling to the A2 and C2. These are the larger versions, more like two to three person ships, um, $400 starting at the C2, 70 meters long though, with a lot more storage. Obviously. Carrying a lot more stuff in here, and that's exactly what we do. We run these things in missions quite a bit when we're doing salvage, and they work very well. Got remote turrets to defend you. You got plenty of space on the interior for a components, vehicle storage, cargo storage, whatever you might need. Solid ship. You can also carry bombs in the A2, which is much, they're much bigger bombs than the A1. As you can see, these are massive bombs. These things will mess you up. <laughs> they only have, I think, four of them on the ship or six. And it costs a lot more because of that, 750 bucks. You've also got the M2, which is basically just an armored C2 with more facilities for people who are going in for that kind of gameplay. Uh, finally, there's the Mercury Star Runner. This was my previous favorite ship. Still one of my favorites because I love that data running. It gives you space for vehicles and cargo and all that kind of stuff you want to carry around. It also gives you a secret shielded storage compartment. So if you're smuggling stuff, this is a good ship to do it on. But unfortunately, they kind of messed up the design with this, making it very, very thick in order to include some secret tunnels underneath. You can kind of see a... This is one of the entrances to these secret tunnels. And they're cool because maybe they'll be used for engineering. Um, they'll be cool because not everybody will know about these. You'll probably be able to hide on these in missions with NPCs. They could be played into the gameplay, but it really did kind of frustrate people when the design changed to accommodate that extra thickness. And you can see that thickness when you look at the old concept images, uh, especially a picture like this. You can see just how high off the ground it was, how skinny it was, had this big thruster in the back, the ramp was smaller. Definitely a different look than when we finally got this. Obviously, it looks, I mean, that's not the same angle, but you can see sort of the thickness added. Great ship, though. Aopoa, Gion Manufacturer. They make a hover bike called the Nox. It, it works, but hover bikes themselves are a little bit rough right now. This is a fun one, though. It goes pretty fast, and it's pretty stylish. They also make the Vulper, which we don't know about yet, but we have seen in some concept images weird looking kind of vertical looking ship we won't stick on that too long the santok yai the bigger brother to the ship that we started with today it's very similar to the car to all it transforms when it's landed it flies very spindly super maneuverable uh this is just the medium fighter to the car to all's light fighter and we already went through the car to all the banu the defender a 25 meter long two-person fighter ship this is actually a pretty cool ship one of the better options for um, a two-person team, because you're kind of equal in your in your roles as firing. You got space on board for some storage, I think maybe. Um, you got beds on board, and it's obviously it's running on a completely different styling from any other ship in the game. This is the Banu style. You saw that the Car to All and Gion ships were different. This one also is, and it's part of why. The Banu Merchantman's taking so long. They have to adapt this style to a massive ship. Banu Merchantman is one of the high, highest anticipated ships there is. And it's been taking a while to get here. But it is like the Kraken Privateer in that it is a bazaar on thrusters. It's a ship. It's a mall. And you're supposed to invite people on to go shopping. Buy stuff from you. Sell stuff to you. It's very interesting. Um... We've also got the Gatak Siulen, which was just revealed as the first vertical takeoff ship in the game. And it's a weird one. Very cool ship, though. If you're looking for that weird take on ships, this is definitely the most unique. And um, I think it'll be a fun one for beginners. Although, make sure you understand how to fly a ship before you get this one. The bigger one is the Raylan, and that's the cargo focused one competing with things like the Hull B, I think, or the Hull C and Starlifter. Crew of one to four. Still transforming just like other Xeon ships. 
but it's a little more bulky as you can tell. It's got these special triangular cargo pods, so I don't know how that's gonna work, but um, it's meant to be a cargo ship that's defensible and usable by humans, and it's gonna be pretty cool. I think they're starting to work on that pretty soon here. Comes at 225 bucks, 54 meters in length. Crewed of one to four. Okay, finally, let's talk about Mirai with the Fury. We just saw the Fury. Small ship, no quantum drive, but it's a little, little scrappy little snub fighter. Um, and it looks really cool. Looks kind of like a TIE fighter. And it transforms so it stores really easily inside of other ships. There are multiple versions of the Fury, but Mirai also makes the Razor, which originally was from Misk, but they moved it over because of the branding. And it's just a nice racing ship that gets some of its technology from the Xion. Again, another niche one, but one that some people are interested in. And finally, Kruger. Kruger with the P-52. This is the one that's attached to the back of the Connie that we talked about. No quantum travel drive either, but it is a useful snub and runabout if you need one in the P-75. P-72 is kind of the nicer variant, sort of similar ship. But that, my friends, might not be all the ships in Star Citizen, but it's all the ones that I can go over today because I, <laughs> I got to go get to work. <laughs> Thank you all for coming to this massive ship show. I don't know how many ships we just went over. Wow, I wasn't expecting to do all that. Thanks for joining. Anybody who stayed for the whole time, I hope you got some good new information. Or if you joined halfway through, whoever you might be, I thought... I, I hope you learned something nice from this and got something good out of it. Some entertainment, some education, I don't know. Four hours of ships, seriously. Yeah.